I'd like to welcome you um, on behalf of Canon Automation to our Technology Day. Uh, my name is Rainer Sitzmann from Canon Automation. I'm the General Manager of Canon Automation GmbH. So I'm responsible that all the business here is going on in the office. I'm managing Canon Automation office. I think most of you um, know me in person. And furthermore, I represent Canon Automation also in the international standardization. So I had been a project leader in the um, ICTC69 uh, WG10, um, which uh, deals with the public charging of light electric vehicles. How can we accompany and uh, secure the charging process by means of a CAN based communication? Furthermore, I'm an expert in the uh, TC9 WG43, which standardizes uh, can open on a constant level in rail vehicles. And finally, I accompanied also the standardization process on a European level um, in a garbage truck application that um, allow can based the exchange of information between uh, several subsystems that are present on such a garbage or refuse collecting vehicle. And furthermore, I'm expert in the corresponding mirror groups of these standardization um, activities. Yeah, let's have a short introduction um, to this uh, event. Here you see the agenda. At the beginning, I will give you a short um, introduction to the um, setup of this evening here. So I give uh, the welcome, I give a short background to Canon Automation, and then I will give a short introduction to KNFD. Um, what is KNFD, what was the motivation, and what is uh, the current status and the future of KNFD. Then we will have a short break, you can uh, make a short refreshment, and then Ms. Yao from Canon Automation will present us um, some insights to the world of the KNFD system design, I think mainly focused on the physical layers, and subsequently I will give you an insight to uh, some migration paths. So think about the situation that have you today, a uh, classical CAN-based network application, and then you think about how to migrate from this situation to KNFD-based solutions. Then after another break, my colleague Mr. Kaploon will um, indicate to us that also higher layer protocols are going to be updated with regard to uh, KNFD to make use from the advantages of KNFD from base of a higher layer protocol. And he will provide us with a can open FD introduction. What is the status here and what are the next steps? Then subsequently, Mr. Holger Salzwanger, the managing director from the Canon Automation Association, uh, presents us how the CanOpen profiles are going to be updated with regard to KNFD and the possibilities provided by KNFD. And after a final break, uh, Mr. Salzwanger will finalize this um, event here, this online event, and it gives an outlook to the future. And this is mainly focused on the current status of the KNXL activities. So. Roughly one hour ago, we uh, closed the last uh, working group meeting with regard to KNXL. So, you see, he can provide us with um, very uh, fresh news about the activities around KNXL. Um, I know from the attendance list, by the way, um, I appreciate very much so much attendees this time here. Um, Many of them I know very well. Some of them, um, maybe they are new to Canon Automation. They are not really aware of what is Canon Automation, what is Canon Automation doing. Uh, very briefly for them, a short background, why there exists something like Canon Automation Association and what are the tasks of Canon Automation and the objectives. So our mission statement is that we want to assist the Canon users in using um, the CAN in the best way in their application and to uh, arise awareness about the controller area network that it can be not only used in the automotive sector but everywhere where something is to be automated also a CAN based solution can be reasonable so it's very flexible, robust, 
um, simple to use and rather cheap. So um, why to limit the use of CAN um, on the automotive application field? Why not thinking about CAN-based solutions um, in many other application fields? And therefore, in 1992, CAN automation had been funded to assist the people and to provide corresponding um, information about CAN so that CAN users, if they have some challenges in their applications, then they can always come to CAN and automation office and can discuss their challenges with CAN and automation and maybe we can directly help them further or the other way around, we can rely on our huge member space. The moment we have roughly about 690 member companies so we can rely on our member space and can say, oh, there exist companies that are specified on solving issues that you have in your project, and so uh, we direct them uh, to these companies and we can assist there for those people so that they can speed up, accelerate with their projects. So briefly, CAN Automation um, develops and maintains CAN Automation specifications, CAN-based, CAN-related specifications, and these for these specifications, we have to do some marketing so that people are aware that there are some specifications to assist users in their application fields. We provide, for example, product guides where you can find corresponding um, tools and products that um, you may need for your project. We uh, provide them brochures why it is reasonable to use a can based solution. And on the other hand, we provide technical application, um, technical events seminars, consultancy services, and so on, to assist people in using CAN in their application. Um, if you want to contact CAN Automation, well, um, these days it's much easier in an electronic way, via phone, via email, or via the social media channels. On the other hand, of course, in non-corona times, of course, um, we appreciate if you come to CAN Automation office or establish a meeting, and then uh, we try to present your can and automation on the one hand and on the other hand we can discuss your problems, issues that are upcoming in your project. Um, briefly to the history of can and automation. Can and automation have been founded in 1992 to assist uh, people in using can and to make people aware of uh, this attractive uh, communication technology for embedded systems. So you see on the one hand, Canon Automation organizes events such as today, but typically as an on-site event. And on the other hand, um, we organize technical meetings where at the end, um, as an outcome, you have corresponding um, Can Automation specifications that allow you using Can in a specific application in the best way. When you go down these dates, as you see in my slides here, then you see that um, Bosch presented uh, CAN with flexible data rate, this CAN FD, on an event organized by CAN in Automation, the 13th International CAN Conference in 2012. And we accompanied then the standardization process. CAN FD had been submitted to ISO standardization and um, successfully released as ISO standard. And we started updating CAN Open with regard to CAN FD. So we released in 2017 the updated CAN Open FD specification. And at the end of 2018, the automotive industry came once again to CAN Automation and said, well, we need some additional functionality in the CAN. Could we start a new project enhancing the functionality provided by CANFD furthermore. And this was the beginning of the CANXL project. To all these topics, we will hear during the next roughly four hours a lot of um, interesting basics and news, status, and next steps. Briefly to CAN and automation, that you can see that CAN is still um, a very relevant communication mean in the application field of embedded communication. You see here um, our um, amount of CAN automation members, and you see the amount of CAN automation members is still growing. We had at the beginning of 2020 670 member companies. So <coughs> although embedded communication at all is no longer the marketing differentiator on fares and in the marketing material, a lot of companies think 
that this can, this rather cheap, robust, flexible, highly available um, communication technology is very attractive for them and therefore they think also it's attractive and reasonable for them being part of Canon Automation. Canon Automation as a member space association has um, two departments. The one is um, the technical committee and the technical working groups which um, organize the technical specification work, the development and the maintenance of our um, technical documents. And here we see we have there several working groups, so-called interest groups. Um, the well-established interest group can open, main doing maintenance for the can open specification. And then derived from this we have now an interest group can open FD that maps now all the well-known uh, specifications we got can open to the CAN FD and uh, looks which kind of new possibilities do exist with regard to CAN FD, how can we use CAN open now in a CAN FD environment in a very efficient way. We will hear with regard to the current status about CAN open FD something in the next uh, four hours. The same is regard to the profiles CAN automation has generated in the last 20 years. A lot of valuable CAN open device and application profiles. What are the next steps with regard to these profiles? How can we reuse them in a CAN FD environment? There we will also hear something in the next presentation. Um, the entire thing around CAN FD um, was treated and accompanied by the interest group layer one and two, in former times we call it interest group KNFD. They were dealing about the physical layer and the data link layer. And we see here on the one hand they finalized the work with regard to KNFD. There are still some jobs to do. On the other hand they are dealing also with the future of can based networking. They founded a special interest group KNXL that is developing the KNXL data link layer and is also discussing some side effects, what could be the appropriate physical layer, um, what about some higher layer specifications, and they are dealing also with regard to security features to be integrated in a an, uh, KNXL-based data link layer. Then we have an IG uh, J9039, this J9039 group um, discusses questions how to update profiles that are not only used in a can open environment but also in a J9039 environment. Is there a kind of possibility to harmonize data um, in can open and J9039? And finally, we have a working group that does very slow progress. It's a working group safety security, and as the title says, it is dealing with these kind of questions. And to a lot of topics addressed by these groups, we will hear today more or less a status uh, summary and a summary about the, an outlook of, into the future, what are the next steps, the expectations um, on these kind of technology. Um, furthermore, Canon Automation has besides the technical activities, the marketing activities. So these marketing activities chaired by the business committee and these marketing groups that are active at the moment are the marketing group for CanOpenFD, how to inform people about the advantages of CanOpenFD, the CanOpenLift group that is um, very engaged in um, organizing plug fests, uh, organizing or accompanying um, exhibitions, uh, the design of the booths, the concepts of the booths, discussing them with Can Automation Office. And last year we have also reinitiated the uh, marketing group for municipal vehicles because they also want uh, to be more active, to be more present in the marketing. Yeah, so much uh, briefly as a summary to CAN Automation. We are organizing also events, um, typically on site, like small conferences, technology days, um, or our, let's say, um, any two years uh, big meeting. Uh, for CAN experts for the CAN community, the International CAN Conference. The 17th International Conference should have been taken place in Baden-Baden in, in March this year. Unfortunately, due to occurrence of the coronavirus, we weren't able to um, have this uh, conference and this meeting of the CAN community. But the good news is at least we have still the proceedings. 
So you can purchase them at Canon Automation Office. You see here the link. And furthermore, it's just postponed. So we will expect that we can have this International Canon Conference uh, maybe mid of next year to discuss then the Canon-related issues in the community. And finally, when you think all this information you will receive today in this event is valuable for you, then i like to give you a hint on our email services where we inform regularly about the um, latest news upcoming in CAN application field. Then all these working groups, which will now present their results and their work, um, they live from your contribution and therefore i like already at this early stage to make some kind of advertisement for our working groups. So all a small, already a small uh, contribution would be very helpful. Submit your comments, your requirements, so that we can consider. And on the other hand, it would be very, very valuable if you take part in these groups nowadays. It's rather easy doing this by a web meeting, for example, and then bring in your requirements and make sure that your requirements are considered in the corresponding specification. For you, the big advantage of being a member is that you have access to all our Canon Automation documents and you get all the information and you know, okay, how is um, something to be organized in the Canon world and how does uh, my Canon network work in the most efficient and best way. Yeah, this is a brief summary with regard to Canon Automation. And then I think we can start and we can dig right now into the topic. Um, with regard to CANFD. Some of you are maybe new to CANFD, therefore we thought it is wise to start with a short wrap-up about CANFD. <coughs> CAN is flexible data rate, what was the motivation and what, what we are talking about and what's the status of CANFD. So, the CAN, you know, had been developed in the early 80s of the last century. Uh, mainly with special regard to the use in the car industry and the passenger cars. And in 1986, uh, this um, controller area network had been presented to the public. 87, 88, there had been the first CAN controller implementations. And in 1990, there had been the first CAN bus implemented in passenger cars, it was the Mercedes S-Class, and from these days the CAN bus made its way. It's now used as the dominating network in the car industry. Um, typically every passenger car has a CAN network inside, not just one, but several ones. And furthermore, the CAN is used in trucks, in buses, in off-highway vehicles, in light electric vehicles, and from this, the CAN made its way also to other application fields as, as the CAN is very scalable, very flexible, very robust. We find CAN also in industry automation and in modular machine building as backbone network or within the modules. So in textile machines, plastic machines, printing machines. So in the modules, typically you find the CAN and sometimes also from module to module. In medical application fields, we see the CAN bus, for example, in intensive care beds. So there the CAN networks, um, the different drives and sensors that are required to bring the patient into the appropriate position to monitor the health data of the patient for these kind of applications we're using there the CAN. Another application are X-ray stands, contrast media injectors, which are networked internally via the controller area network. Also in building automation, we find the CAN in several uh, niches. So for example, in elevator control applications, we find the CAN very extensively. So for example, Deutsche Bahn is um, using the CAN in their elevator applications, in the railway stations. Then um, the market leader in embedded door control systems is using the CAN bus for um, controlling turnstiles, um, entrance doors, and so on. In uh, commercial vehicles, off-highway vehicles, cranes, excavators, the CAN is the dominating network. We see the CAN also in aircraft, helicopters, 
maritime applications, railways. So we can see the CAN has made its way into all the application fields and is very robust and reliable. Uh, but we have also in the automotive industry the issue that sometimes the CAN became the bottleneck. So for example, for uh, firmware updates, and it takes the time till all the data is streamed down via the CAN wire. So the CAN, as the title says, controller area network is a network that is optimized for starting, stopping some processes, exchanging some analog values maybe, but for sure not for streaming data. And therefore, if we sometimes have to update um, devices or entire applications, then while the CAN, this uh, may take some time and the CAN may really get the bottleneck in these kind of applications. And therefore, the automotive industry went to Bosch and said, well, isn't there a possibility to update um, the classical CAN in a way that we get a higher data throughput? On the one hand, for software download, upload of diagnostic memories, or in some specific cases that we need also during system runtime some higher data throughput, especially if you think about some cloud-based applications there you may need to communicate in addition to the pure control data, also some nice to have data so that it is available in the cloud-based application. And as a consequence, then Bosch did some development and presented the CAN FD, the CAN with flexible data rate. So you see here on this slide a summary where all the history started. The slide here starts with a BOSS specification that had been submitted for ISO standardization <coughs> in 1993. There was then uh, the first publication of the ISO standard 11898, which is well known as the CAN standard. And then in 2003, there was uh, this CAN standard divided into the data link layer part and the physical layer part, the high speed physical layer in the dash two document and the data link layer in the dash one document. And when the CANFD came up, then there was a big discussion, um, how should we standardize CANFD in the best way? Um, should it be an add-on to the classical CAN or should it become an own CAN standard? And then there was the decision to say, okay, let's consider the CAN FD as a kind of add-on to the classical CAN and let's merge classical CAN and CAN FD into the very same standard and therefore the ISO 11898-1 had been updated and had been published 2015, a new version covering now classical CAN and CAN FD. Furthermore, um, as we now consider higher data rates, we want to communicate faster compared to classical CAN. We need to double check the parameters, the operating limits for the physical layers. So we, there was also the necessity to update the physical layer document and the accompanying conformance test plan. Now, let's have a short look how was the um, CAN updated. When CAN was updated, there was one requirement, um, please keep the nature of classical CAN. So all those users of classical CAN should not learn or should not be forced to learn something entire new, but there was the idea to say, okay, they should keep most of their knowledge and the only thing is we want to add some additional functionality, higher um, data throughput, larger payload and these things. So when then Bosch thought, okay, how could we update the classical CAN? The idea was um, we want to keep the simplicity of CAN, which is expressed in the main way, in the way the data flow is negotiated. So if you have a new device and you want to enter it into a CAN-based system, you have just to think about a CAN identifier and because of the priority of the CAN identifier, the data frames of this new device will range in into the existing data flow. You don't have to think on um, some special measures. This is everything handled automatically via um, the CAN and the so-called bitwise arbitration mechanism. Unfortunately, during this bitwise arbitration, it works like that, that your um, 
can controller writes a bit and then the can controller more or less double checks have I really written the bit or has somebody overwritten my bit and has uh, told me by that um, that he has a higher prior can message to be transmitted than me and therefore I get something that's called an in-bit time response and this in-bit time response this is um, the real limiting factor in CAN. On the one hand, it makes the life of a system designer very easy. System designer can simply add this new device and the frames range in according to the priority of the CAN identifiers. But on the other hand, I have this in time response and this limits my um, maximum communication speed on the one hand and also the network extension. But as soon as it is clear who is the sender, who is sending a frame and this arbitration is over, we enter a so-called streaming phase. In this streaming phase, I can turn up the communication speed in principle to that what my physical layer is capable to drive. So you see here, we have here an example where we had a real CAN-based network based on uh, CAN transceiver that had been designed for classical CAN and under laboratory condition this uh, CAN network had been running with 15 Mbit in the so-called data phase. So we could turn up the communication speed to what the physical layer is capable to drive in this streaming phase and then at the end of a CAN frame there's once again this acknowledgement and this acknowledgement is an in-bit time response once again and there are all the limitations are valid that had been valid already using the so-called arbitration phase. So <clears throat> when the boss engineers evaluated this, they said, okay, let's start in a classical way, keep all the classical CAN attributes during the arbitration phase, and then as soon as it is clear who is the sender, we jump to an accelerated bitrate and transfer with a higher bitrate the major part of the CAN frame, the data field, and then at the end we are switching back to the acknowledge phase, to the communication speed that we had during the arbitration phase. So we see this on the next slide. We can see here if we start, for example, at 500 kilobits, and then we start accelerating during the data phase with our communication speed. Then we see here we could achieve an average speed, uh, communication speed of roughly 1.4 Mbit um, here in CANFD. Now you can. Uh, read this in more detail in the white paper from Mr. Florian Hartwig from Robert Bosch GmbH and he presented this at the 13th International Client Conference in 2012. And he furthermore presented how you can increase the efficiency if you extend the data field. And there he presented that if you open up the data feed up to 64 bytes, you can achieve an average communication speed of roughly 3 Mbit. So this means you not only accelerate the communication during um, the data field, but you increase the efficiency by enlarging the data field. And we see this here. CANFD allows us to enlarge the data field to up to 64 bytes. And CANFD allows us to transmit this data field with a higher bitrate. So CAN with flexible data rate means you have the option to transmit more data up to 64 bytes and this data in an accelerated way. Um, and then if you do so, you're using exactly two communication speeds, one for the arbitration phase and um, then at the end of the CAN frame, starting with the acknowledge field, and in between, you're using exactly one additional accelerated communication speed for communicating this data field in an accelerated way. To give you more realistic values, as I said, the data transmission phase may be with a transmitted with a communication speed to what your physical layer is capable to drive. If we have a look to the physical layer standards, then we see there um, communication speed of 2 Mbit and 5 Mbit specified, operating limit specified for these uh, two bit rates. So these are realistic values considered for the data transmission phase. If we compare now the classical CAN frame with a CANFD frame, then we see they are rather identical. They are having the same amount of bit fields, 
they um, having the same namings of the bit fields, no additional bit fields we see here. The only thing what we see is that some bit fields differ a little bit in the size. We have a little bit enlarged control field. We have now, of course, the option to transmit 64 byte instead of 8 byte. And as we have a larger CAN frame now, we have to use an optimized CSD mechanism. And this may lead to the fact that the CSC field may comprise 22 or 26 bit. But all the rest is almost identical to that what we know already from classical CAN. If we have browsed roughly through the uh, bit fields, then we see here start of frame field is completely identical to classical CAN. And also the arbitration field is more or less identical to classical CAN. So in classical CAN, we have the base frame format, the 11-bit identifier, and the 29-bit um, identifier format, the extended frame format. In both frame formats, we have also in KNFT. Furthermore, we see here an R1-bit. The R1-bit um, in classical CAN is the so-called RTR-bit, remote transmission request indication. We indicate that we are using now a uh, remote transmission request frame to request a data frame from another uh, network participant. In KNFD, this remote frame format is not available, so um, we cannot code a remote request in the KNFD frame format. So I think there's a strong hint that we should avoid the usage of remote frames. We articulated this already in the past with regards to classical CAN, avoid usage of remote frames now in KNFD, we don't have even the option to do so. Nevertheless, um, take care. If you code, for example, in classical CAN, a remote frame that corresponds to a data frame that is coded in KNFD frame format, then it may happen that this data frame is correspondingly triggered by this remote frame. But um, for the moment, we just remember, okay, in KNFD, we have no longer the option of coding remote frames. With regard to the control field, here we have some differences in the classical CAN control field. We have 6-bit, now we have a 9-bit size control field. And we start with the IDE identifier extension bit. The identifier extension bit um, differentiates, do we use the 11-bit or the 29-bit identifier? Um, it's the same mechanism as in classical CAN. And in classical CAN, we would have here the R0-bit. Now it's called the FDF-bit and it indicates are we in a classical frame format, that is the dominant bit, or do we have here the CAN FD frame format. So if we see a recessive bit, we see the following bit stream, a new R0 bit for future extension, so this could be in future the CAN XL bit, always a dominant bit, and after that we have the so-called BRS bit, bit rate switch bit, and at the sample point of this BRS bit, then we have, would switch, if it's indicated like that, we would switch to the accelerated data transmission phase. So the easy bit, the error state indicator, is then the first bit that has been transmitted in an accelerated way. Just for you to remember, BRS bit can be either dominant or recessive. If it's dominant, this would indicate that we transmit the entire frame with one uh, communication speed with that communication speed, the so called nominal bitrate that had been used already for the transmission of the arbitration phase of the arbitration field. If we set this bit to a recessive bit, then we would switch at the sample point to the accelerated communication speed. Finally, we have here these four uh, bits for DLC identical to classical CAN, we indicate with these four bits the size of the data field. And in maximum, the size of the data field can have 64 bytes. So this we, at the, this we see at the next slide here. We start, as in classical CAN, with a binary counter from 0 up to 8. We have the indication how many data bytes do we have in the data field. And then, Let's start something new. The value is 9 to 15. Here we have a real coding now in the data length code. The value 9 corresponds to the 12, 10 to the 16, 
11 to the 20, and so on, up to the 15, that indicates that we're using 64 data bytes. This means we can enlarge our data field only step by step. This we have to consider when we're running higher layer protocols based on KNFD, that we have always to fill up up to the next supported uh, KNFD frame length by means of padding bytes or something like that to communicate only very defined data. These fields are then secured by the CRC checksum and therefore we are using two different CRCs depending on the size of our data field. If our data field is not larger than 16 bytes, then we are using a 17-bit CRC checksum. If it is larger, we are using a 21-bit CRC checksum. And the reason for this is that we want to keep the robustness and the reliability of classical CAN, and therefore there had been these two generator polynomes chosen to achieve this reliability. We see here we have something that is called a stuff count. The stuff count had been introduced to be able to detect specific um, error conditions that were not detectable just because of the CRC uh, polynomial. Um, during standardization process had been then introduced the stuff count field. You count all the stuff bits that had been inserted up to this uh, stuff count field in our bit stream and then according to specific formulas which you see here and on this slide then you provide the amount of stuff bits that had been uh, inserted in this bit stream here in this stuff count field. If you have a stuff count field in your KNFD frame, then this is the so-called ISO KNFD frame, frame format. So if you have an early implementation with a missing stuff count field, then you know this is a so-called non-ISO KNFD implementation, an early bird implementation with regard to KNFD. And furthermore, you see here always these fixed stuff bits. The fixed stuff bits we need to generate edges to resynchronize our network with the um, idea that all the devices switch back at the very same moment um, to the communication speed that we were using during arbitration phase. And this we do at the sample point of the CSC delimiter bit. So at this bit here, we switch back to the um, slow communication speed that we had used at the beginning of our KNFD communication. After that, we have our acknowledge slot. This mechanism works in principle identical to that what we know from classical CAN, but um, as we are switching back here at the CRC delimiter bit, um, KNFD says, okay, I allow some kind of deviation, so if I detect a lengthened um, acknowledge slot, then I accept this as well. And after that, when I have detected my acknowledge, it goes on with the acknowledge delimiter, end of frame, and all those things identical to classical case. So, summing up, we have also the error frame and the overload frame in KNFD. So, the error frame, if we detect during the transmission of an accelerated KNFD frame some errors, then we switch back to the nominal communication speed indicate our error identical as in classical CAN. The overload frame works identical as in classical CAN, as I have already mentioned, there's no remote frame in KNFD available. Briefly, <coughs> to, uh, uh, some ideas for the physical layer. Also, the physical signaling um, depends for the physical layer, the bit encoding, the bit timing, and here some work to this. So when we're talking about the bit timing and thinking about the sample point, we have also to consider something that is called a transmitter loop delay. So if we communicate with an accelerated bit rate higher than one Mbit, then the bit timing, uh, the time of one single bit gets rather short, the nominal bit time gets rather short, and it may be shorter than the signal runtime from the controller pin out via the printed circuit board, via the transceiver to the bus and back, for example, for doing something like bit monitoring. And this signal runtime may be larger than one nominal bit time. You buffer bits here on the bus 
And this simple example shows that you transmit a certain bit pattern and if you would do some bit monitoring, you might be in danger if you receive here some bits that you compare for this bit monitoring erroneous bits with each other. To avoid something like that, you have to do something that is called uh, transmitter loop delay compensation and therefore have an eye on your um, CAN chips if you select some CAN hardware for your devices that this, these CAN controllers support transmitter loop delay compensation based on measurement. In this case, your CAN controller would measure the signal runtime from this edge here, from the FDF bit, a recessive bit, to the dominant R0 bit. How long does it take till this bit is received on my RXD pin? And therefore, I measure exactly how long does it take at the moment um, the signal runtime, and as this signal runtime may be, for example, temperature dependent and may have further dependencies on the environmental conditions, my application, it may be rather reasonable to use this mechanism to increase the stability of your KNFD network. In brief, um, with regard to the physical layer, we had for classical CAN our um, ISO 11898-2 from the year 2003 describing the high-speed transceiver. We had then some additional um, extensions for sleep mode, low power mode, selective wake-up capability and partial networking. And all these standards had been merged to an updated ISO 11898-2 from the year 2016 describing operational limits for high-speed transceivers capable to run up to 5 Mbit, but also providing functionalities such as remote wake-up, partial network, selective wake-up, and so on. So, the hardware is available, so we did a summary uh, prior to the Embedded World Fair in February, and we got back some indication from our members that several companies offer KNFD IP cores, um, microcontrollers with onboard KNFD controllers, transceivers that are qualified up to 5 Mbit, for example, from microchip, from NXP. Um, several companies offer already higher layer protocol stacks, for example, for CanOpenFD. So, um, protocol stacks that have been updated with regards to KNFD and making use of KNFD and there exists a broad range of KNFD board level products. So, you can really start with KNFD. KNFD is now already on the street, so on the um, international um, car fair in Frankfurt last year. So, Volkswagen presented the Golf Neo introducing um, five KNFD networks. Also in the Golf 8 there will be KNFD inside. So we see KNFD is now coming on the road, not only in Volkswagen, but also in other cars from other car makers in the US, in Europe, and also in Asia. So we can expect KNFD now in a lot of applications. Therefore, also the uh, devices and parts are available for using KNFD in other application fields than the car field as well. Um, we are running out of time, therefore just briefly, um, the milestones you have seen with regard to the standardization, most of the things have been done. Um, with regard to the diagnostic in cars, these documents are currently under the available, so we expect this year or next year that this communication is updated with regard to KNFD. We are, or we have now the chance uh, of an open door to submit here some security mode also for KNFD. Therefore, uh, can automation is entitled to prepare something and to submit them here in the ISO standardization. And this work had already been done with regard to the signal improvement. And here, I think we can submit this to ISO very soon and to initiate there the standardization process. At Canon Automation itself, we are also writing some um, recommendations. So I think here of high interest is the Series 601, where we provide a lot of recommendations with regard to physical interface implementation, controller interface um, implementation, system design recommendations, 
Here they already mentioned ringing suppression is now called um, signal improvement circuitry. What are the capabilities of these um, hardware chips? What can they do? What can we achieve? How can we support system design? We will hear later on something from Ms. Yao. And we are working on reference topologies. So I think um, especially if you are planning to work with 601, this is a very interesting document series. So we have still some work to do here at Can Automation with KNFD as well. So we are trying to organize some plug threads with regard to the SIG transceivers. At the moment, I think there exists only one implementation on the market from NXP, but there may come some from Infineon. We're working on the reference topologies and the already mentioned um, security mode. Yeah, briefly, um, KNFD is introduced in the market. You are transmitting one CAN frame with two uh, communication speeds. On the one hand, with, uh, you start with a nominal speed and then after it is clear who is the sender, you have now the option at the so-called BRS bit to switch to an accelerated transmission speed to increase the efficiency for transmitting an up to 64 byte large data field and after the transmission of these fields and the transmission of the CRT checksum, you are switching back to the slow speed uh, which you have been used for starting the transmission of this KNFD frame. Yeah, um, it is standardized, recommendations are available. As I've said, the 600 series at KN Automation reference systems are still under development. So they are, once again, um, a request from my side to you. Um, if you have some requirements, if you have already some results in this direction, then please submit them to the working group. They would appreciate your contributions very much. High layer protocols are currently under review. Some are already updated, also at Canon Automation. Others are still under, um, under review. And furthermore, in this entire work, we treat also security and safety issues. Yeah, so much as a first introduction to KNFD to bring everybody on the same level. What is KNFD? How does it work? Now, Ms. Yao is going to present um, something about the system design. So, Ms. Yao is um, also chairing or attending from Can Automation the interest group layer one and two, and is there mainly working also with the um, physical layer task force dealing with the um, signal improvement uh, circuit transceiver. So she's telling us about uh, these insights of the working group. And thank you, Yao. Please present us. OK, thank you, uh, Mr. Zisman. So I hope uh, everyone can hear me. And um, so he has already introduced uh, me uh, shortly. And because I, um, I'm working on this topic, uh, also in the working group, um, IG layer, uh, the, um, lay, uh, the interesting group, um, layer one, two. So um, uh, this uh, working group was uh, previously um, the uh, interested group, CanFD. So uh, I will... Uh, introduce you uh, shortly about this topic. So um, why should we discuss the KNFD system design, namely uh, node and network design? There are some issues that make the system design for KNFD network uh, very important. In KNFD networks, the rules and uh, recommendations uh, need to be more strict because higher bit rates bring the network closer to the physical limits. Towards higher bit rates, uh, the symmetry becomes more and more important. If the transceiver is very uh, asymmetric, the recessive bit timing is extremely shortened or lengthened compared to the nom uh, nominal bit time. This will cause uh, an error. And uh, in order to achieve uh, interoperability of devices, the bit timing should be the same in all nodes. This is nothing new for engineers familiar with classical CAN network designs. However, in classical CAN networks, there are some tolerances allowed regarding the bit timing settings, but in KFD network, 
the bedtime settings is more strict. Of course, when uh, not using the bit rate switch function, the um, bit timing is as in classical can. But uh, when using the two bit rates, the system designer should take care that all nodes apply the very same uh, bit timing settings. So the third reason, the actual version of um, ESO, um, the ESO standards uh, 11.8.9.8-1 which is published in um, 2015, defines, um, uh, defines the classical CAN um, protocol and the CAMPD protocol. And the part two of these standards uh, specifies um, only the transceiver characteristics qual uh, qualified for data bit rates up to two Mbits and up to five Mbits. Um, both standards don't uh, provide any system and no system recommendations. This is the reason why we should talk about uh, the node and network design. Then we move to the next slide to see some details. Um, normally, uh, recessive bits can be much shorter than the dominant bits. Um, this figure shows uh, the sampling of a recessive bit. The sampling of the recessive bit in a transmitting node is yeah, um, potentially more critical than the sampling of a dominant bit. And this figure shows the sampling um, of a recessive bit with also with the uh, secondary sample point and uh, contains the most important effects that leads to a delay of the dominant to recessive age um, including the uh, transmitter delay, the um, bit asymmetry, and the ringing effect, as shown in the figure, the one, two, and three. The bit asymmetry can be introduced by kind of the physical layer components. System designer should select uh, physical layer components with uh, minimized asymmetry values to guarantee a functional and robust KFD network, the bit asymmetry should be as small as possible. Now, another important effect to lead the delay of the uh, to lead the delay of the age is uh, the ringing effect, is the zone um, three. Ringing effect could cause an unstable receiving signal. So here you can see uh, the um, the secondary sample point. If the transmitter delay compensation is applied. The bus state is sampled at this secondary sample point. So the system designer can configure the secondary sample point uh, to any position in the receive bit. For this reason, um, to, um, to reduce the uh, effects, different specifications are developed to um, help node and system designer to establish a robust KFD communication. They are following uh, system design um, specifications, CIA, YASPA, and, uh, SA, uh, and, and SAE are developing uh, device and network design recommendations. The nonprofit uh, organization SA, uh, SAE developed two, recommenda uh, two uh, recommended pra uh, practices for KFD node and system design. They are the documents SAE uh, J2284-2-4 uh, uh, and dash 5. The uh, Japan Automotive Software Platform and Architecture Association, uh, for short YASPA, developed also guidelines for KFG device and system design. Additionally, um, YASPA cooperates with CIA. Uh, we exchange documents and comment and comment them each other. The previous can uh, the um, the uh, previous CIA interested group KFG has been discussing the topic since years and has released uh, several parts of the CIA 601 series, which provide KFG node and system design recommendations and guidelines. So now we take a look uh, on this slide. You can see the uh, document list. Um, the CIA uh, 601 part one document provides some useful information 
about the transceiver loop delay symmetry, the bit timing symmetry, and uh, transmitter delay compensation. This document uh, explains how to interpret and consider the parameters uh, which are given by the um, transceiver chip suppliers uh, and um, help the uh, node and uh, system designer to understand the ISO standard uh, 11898-2 better. So part two described the uh, specified interface between the protocol controller implementing the CAN FG data link layer protocol and the host controller inclu uh, including necessary configuration registers. The part two document recommended uh, the bit timing configuration and some um, optimization hints for the phase margin. This includes uh, uh, recommendations for topology and device design. The newest released one is the part four, in which the signal improvement capability transceiver is specified. This enables data bit rates uh, of up to uh, eight Mbits, depending, yeah, uh, depending on the network uh, topology. The CIA, uh, the uh, part six provides the specification of the mechanical and uh, electrical parameters for cables to be used in CAMD networks. So the above parts um, are already released uh, as draft, draft standard. In general, the documents uh, with the status uh, draft standards are only for CA members available but now uh, we provide uh, also uh, non-members to subscribe the uh, DS documents uh, for which uh, say membership is not possible in principle. The parts uh, five um, and uh, parts uh, uh, in the CIA uh, 110 are still in the development. The uh, 110 uh, document specifies the electrical and mechanical parameter of the commode chokes to be used in classical CAN networks or uh, KFD networks. So a commode choke can uh, feature the um, electromagnetic emission from a device through the CAN transceiver and uh, limiting the unwanted high frequency noise on the CAN network. And uh, the part uh, uh, 601 part five is also, uh, is also uh, in the development is but now uh, pending. So if uh, you are working on the um, topology, uh, working on um, CAN FD network uh, design, uh, you could contact us and um, we are, um, um, every comment or proposal are welcomed. So today I will uh, introduce uh, some uh, important uh, issues uh, or um, which are specified in the uh, CA 601 uh, document series. And uh, to understand better what is the KFD system design, we take a look the, uh, at the physical interface layers according to the uh, OSI reference layers, uh, which um, Mr. Zisman uh, has already showed. and. Um, you can see um, the uh, physical layer can be divided in three sub layers. And um, on the right side, the uh, according standards, they are, uh, the, uh, the according standards are, li are listed, um, which uh, uh, that cover the um, according sub layers. One of the important issue of the KFD system time is the setting of the bit timing. So one bit time is specified as four non-overlapping time segments. Um, we can uh, take a look at first the next slide. So uh, these four uh, segments. Uh, each segment is constructed from an integral multiple of the time quantum. For short, uh, names uh, T, uh, TQ. The time quantum is the smallest uh, uh, discrete, uh, discrete timing resolution used by a CAN node. Its length is generated by a, a programmable divide uh, 
of the CAN nodes oscillator frequency. Um, there is a minimum of eight and a maximum of 25 time quanta per nominal bit time. The bit time is alleged by programming the wise of the time quantum and the number of the ti uh, time quantum in the various segments. This has to be done in the CAN controller. So one um, bit time consists of the uh, synchronization segment, propagation segment, uh, the phase buffer segment one, two. The uh, sync sig is um, used to synchronize the various CAN, the various CAN nodes on the bus. And H, is uh, and H is expected to be detected within this segment. And is always, uh, and, this, um, and this segment is always one time quantum. The uh, sample point is um, located, um, is located between the uh, phase uh, segment one and uh, phase segment two. And uh, another one important parameter is the uh, synchronization jumped wise. As a result of uh, re-synchronization, uh, re uh, phase segment one may be lengthened or uh, phase segment two may be shortened. The amount of the uh, lengthening and the shortening of the phase buffer segments has an upper limit given by the synchronization jumpwise. So in the um, arbitration phase, the sample point is um, at the very far end of the bit time, the maximum possible network length can be achieved. Sampling earlier reduce the, uh, achieve, uh, re, um, re, uh, reduces the achievable network length, um, but increases uh, robustness. A value of higher than 80% um, is not recommended for automotive applications due to robustness reasons. So the bit timing configuration has two aspects. One is uh, setting the nominal time quantum for the arbitration phase and the data time quantum for the data phase. The other is uh, to set uh, the related sample points, uh, including the secondary sample points uh, if the uh, transceiver delay compensation is used. So in the CIA uh, 601 part three, uh, there are recommendations, uh, the bit timing setting uh, as shown on the slide. So um, the fourth one uh, to set the uh, quantum um, arbitration phase and the quantum of the data phase the same. This prevents that uh, during bit rate switching a large uh, quantization error transform into a phase error. The second one uh, to uh, make uh, the uh, time quantum of arbitration phase as short as possible. The length of the time quantum is arbitration phase. Um, in the arbitration phase should be no longer than uh, the time quantum in the data phase. This uh, minimizes the sync uh, segment of a bit and reduces the uh, quantization error. So the third one, you should choose the highest available CAN clock frequency. Um, higher CAN clock frequency uh, enable configure a shorter can, uh, time quantum. So CIA uh, recommends uh, to implement CAN clock frequency of 40 megahertz or um, 80 megahertz. So the next one, um, all nodes uh, shall have the very same sample points. Uh, in arbitration phase. And different sample points in arbitration and data phase have no impact on robustness, but uh, different sample points in the nodes uh, reduce the robustness and lead to phase errors in the data phase. So the next one, um, since the uh, static uh, phase shift between transmitter and receiver is not relevant in the data phase, the uh, propagation segment may be sent to a length um, of a zero time quanta. This alone making the buffer segment and the, um, 
and uh, the uh, synchrona uh, uh, synchronization uh, jump wise larger, giving more freedom in placing the uh, sample point. The sample points should be placed in the middle um, between the time when the bus signal has uh, stab uh, stabilized and after possible late age at the beginning of the bit and the possible early age and the end of that bit. So the last one, uh, we should enable um, the TDC uh, transceiver delay compensation um, for data phase. So in this case, the bit rate pre and shall be set to one or two. It is not recommended to configure the TDC with a fixed value because the large transmitter delay can change. In the uh, part two of the uh, 601 document, um, recommendates um, to use uh, the uh, can, uh, can clock uh, frequency 20 megahertz, 40 megahertz, or 80 megahertz um, as the um, oscillator frequency. Um, other frequencies should not be used. This is not specified uh, in the ISO standards. Um, another recommendation in this document is the um, number of the bit timing register to be implemented. This figure shows the uh, uh, theoretical possible can bit timing configuration in the data phase. And uh, you can see in the figure shows two eyes. The large eye uh, represents the possible bit timing setting with the uh, in this document recommended configuration range. And the uh, small eye re uh, represents the possible bit timing settings uh, specified in the, in the ISO standard. The ISO standard just require um, a small register, which is um, sufficient for some bit rate combinations of the arbitration bit times and the data bit times. In case of using a large ratio between arbitration and data phase bit times, the, standards, the, uh, the uh, standardized the size of the bit timing register is not fit. Therefore, uh, this power document recommendates for the arbitration phase a register um, of um, five time quanta uh, to uh, 385 time quanta. The, um, and uh, for the data phase should be the range from uh, four time counter to 49 time counter. And uh, then uh, in the part three, uh, list all configurable date, uh, uh, data bit rates for the uh, recommended uh, can clock frequencies as uh, illustrated in the figure. This covers the configuration range of the bit timing parameters recommended by the part two document. So to find a meaningful bit timing and sample point configuration for your setup, so you should choose an initial data bit timing configuration and consider the previous introduced recommendations for the parameter choice. This, uh, initial, uh, uh, this uh, initial data bit timing configuration should be op optimized later. For all data bit rates uh, and a data phase, Sample point of 17% uh, is recommended uh, as a starting point. You should also determine the uh, asymmetry in the system as described in the um, document part three. Uh, in this document, uh, is this provided and um, also a sprite sheet to help uh, evaluating uh, if the initial data bit timing configuration is functional in the system setup. So nach the, uh, evalu uh, nach the, uh, uh, after the e evaluation, if necessary, then you should uh, optimize the data phase uh, sample point position. So now uh, we see the recessive base sampling uh, figure again. One of the, uh, the other important effect that lead the delay of the uh, falling age is the signal ringing. So uh, what is the signal ringing? The signal ringing is caused by the reflection of the communication voltage wave because of the impedance mismatch caused by, um, for example, N-terminated stops 
or uh, branches in CAN network topology. In classical CAN, um, the ringing effect was already existed, but is not very critical. But uh, with the higher bit rates in the CANFG network, it is difficult to establish a robust CANFG communication and the network which has much signal ringing. Because the bit rate is increasing, therefore the bit time is shortened and the bit decision time is also shortened, while the signal ringing time is the same as in the, class, in the classical CAN. So for a proper functionality, it is necessary that a current reflective wave don't uh, surprise the dominant uh, differential voltage below uh, nine, um, uh, nine, uh, 900 millivolt and do not increase the recessive differential voltage level above the 500 millivolt at each uh, CAN node. Um, to uh, relieve uh, these effects, system designer have to limit the com um, Com uh, complexity of their topologies. This could, but uh, but this could add an add more cost and weight to the uh, wiring harness. Um, for example, by awarding long and end terminated stops or remaining instead with the um, reduced number of nodes in a typically uh, uh, linear network. So CIA has um, established the tax force signal improvement to discuss uh, this topic and uh, has already uh, released in the uh, part four of the 601 document uh, at the version one um, in, uh, in the year uh, 2015. Because the automotive industry is highly interested in this topic and in the meantime, different technologies are being developed. CIA uh, has started uh, the discussion again, and there are two concepts for signal improvement uh, discussed on the meeting. One is to suppress the ringing on the critical receiving nodes, and the other one is to suppress the ringing on the uh, or uh, on all the transmitting nodes. The updated uh, version two uh, is released. Uh, last year and uh, provides the specification for the transceiver with SIG function, in which the important time behavior is specified uh, as similar as in the ISO 11898-2. The specification is uh, implementation independent. And using uh, this um, uh, can transceiver the six function would allow achieving higher bit rates and allow you uh, and allow uh, higher asymmetries caused by the um, not optimized network topology. In this figure, uh, we can see how the uh, signal improvement works. The figure above shows an example for the KFG transceiver behavior with the SIG function. The voltage, signal, uh, the voltage signal is the uh, differential signal of the receiver input. You can see uh, much ringing at a state transition from dominant to recessive. The um, signal um, RXD2 is an example of a potential behavior of the receiving signal. For a recessive state, the voltage should not uh, uh, exit 500 millivolt and the voltage overshoot um, can cause the dominant glitches on the um, RXD. The worst uh, case lengthening of the dominant states is shown on the uh, example RSD3. Some transceivers might uh, feature out the recessive understood and extend the dominant level on RXD. The figure uh, below um, shows the behavior of the CAN transceiver with the SIG function. And uh, RSD1 illustrates the preferred and improved behavior on uh, RSD ping of the transceiver by using the CAN SIG transceiver. In generally, the operating principle of the SIG function is to drive the signal actively to recessive. In addition, um, the part four recommends also the uh, maximum uh, supported one-way propagation delay. As shown in the figure, um, this is uh, the uh, two nodes um, um, that 
this is the, uh, the uh, propagation delay between any ECUs which has the uh, maximum distance in the network. And the supported uh, one-way propagation delay is calculated based on the uh, specified timing behavior as a long uh, signal improvement time and uh, the transceiver's uh, symmetry of the can seek transceiver. This uh, recommendation uh, depends on the supported highest uh, arbitration bit rate, but uh, it is um, independent of uh, data bit rate. Data bit rates up to eight um, Mbits can be considered also. As an example, um, I show uh, this, uh, the uh, latest update uh, from uh, the Volkswagen. Um, this is uh, topologies, uh, not with CAN FD, but also with the um, new uh, generation technique CAN SL. So this is uh, already valid uh, um, with uh, eight country units and a total line uh, length of, um, um, of 10 meter. And uh, in this new um, topology, uh, you can uh, is also the um, can um, the can uh, the can transceiver with six function used. So uh, there are also uh, another document uh, CA six o three, and um, specify the time stamping in the classical can CAN-FD network. So for details, you can read this document uh, in a paper of uh, the expert uh, Florian Hartwig from Bosch the paper in the 16th uh, ICC conference. So there are also these additional uh, SAE specifications and um, the part four uh, specified the, uh, for the network with the KFD data, uh, data bit rate at two embeds and then part five is for the uh, KFD data bit rate as five embeds. Um, with the uh, specification and, uh, do and the, the uh, documents, the KFD system designed for the higher bit rate uh, stays uh, still a difficult topic to judge if a network is working. Uh, network simulation is normally required uh, to check all cases or to test the network even in the lab. Uh, can automation organizes a uh, plug fest as a service for CIA members. The purpose of the KFD uh, plug fest is in order to, in, uh, to prove the interoperability of nodes, implementing the improved uh, KFD protocol. And this uh, plug fest is for the uh, member only, and participation is free of charge. So here is an example of the uh, plug fest in the year uh, 2016 in Detroit. And uh, you can see a topology uh, of the um, Ford. Uh, and this is, uh, and this, is test, uh, this is tested, uh, the, uh, the running harness is tested. So now uh, with the development of the uh, CAN-SIG transceiver, CIA intends to organize a plug fest for the CAN-SIG transceiver. Uh, several semiconductor manufacturers uh, are interested to attend the plug fest as soon as the hardware is available. So to sum up the speech, um, the uh, one uh, robust KFD physical layer system um, the, uh, design require to respect more rules and uh, each system design needs to be valid individually like a plug fest or uh, to make a simulation. And the reference topologies for general KFD applications needs to be development. So this topic is still pending. If you have proposal for the reference topologies or if you are developing a KFD network, please contact us and every proposal and comments are welcome. So. This is all of my presentation. And thank you for listening and the attention. So I hand over the webinar to Mr. Zisman. Thank you, Yao. Um, maybe we should wait whether there are some uh, questions to your speech. One has been in the chat. So maybe you would like to say some words about it. So there has been the question, um, we have mentioned that there are two Mbit and five Mbit referenced by the physical layer standards. Is this um, the general limit for KNFD or 
Um, can you say some words about this, Yao? Um, do you uh, mean, uh, do you mean uh, the um, ISO H nine eight dash two? Yes. Um, so in the um, in this document, uh, they are uh, can uh, KFD transceiver uh, specified and. Uh, uh, for the um, data uh, bit rates and um, up to um, uh, qualified for the data bit rates and up to two embeds and up to five embeds. Mm -hmm. So, but um, the for higher uh, data bit rates, yeah, they are not specified in this document. But uh, so uh, with the SIG transceiver, uh, for example, uh, you can achieve um, eight. Um, embeds for the data bit rate, for example. So summing up, correct me if I'm wrong, I think uh, this document summarizes the parameters uh, which I can use, for example, then according to the uh, related conformance test for qualifying my hardware, my chips, my CAN transceiver implementations, but um, what I can achieve in a real application or network, um, this depends then on um, the device design, the system design, uh, the topology which I'm using, the impedance gaps that I have, and all these things. Correct? Yes, yes. And, uh, okay. and uh, these things, uh, they are not specified in the ISO standards. So this makes the system design very difficult. So uh, you can take a look in the CAA um, 601 series and find some hints. I will present you something about migration passes from classical CAN to CAN FD. Um, to bring us um, together on the same level, um, I started um, this event here with a small comparison classical CAN to CAN FD. And there I compared um, the data frame and we see here in the upper part the classical data frame with the arbitration field, the control field with six bits, the 8 by data field and so on. And compared to this in the FD frame format, the 64 byte uh, data field and the option of transmitting this frame in an accelerated way, especially in the part of the data field. And um, there had been one slide very uh, shortly shown in the presentation from Ms. Yao um, that we have to think about some impacts in the system design um, to run uh, classical CAN and CANFD in parallel. That if we want to use CANFD, we have to think about for which purpose do we like to use CANFD. And um, there was also the option, or there is also the option, not to make use of the accelerated communication speed, but to run one CAN FD frame with one single communication speed um, that you use during the arbitration phase. And of course, this has impact on the physical layer design, so you can use or reuse the entire physical layer as you used to use it for classical CAN in your existing application. As soon as you, if you accelerate a little bit, uh, maybe from today's 125K or 250K to 500K, then um, the impact on the physical layer design shouldn't be too big. Also, in this environment, you should be able to run the very same topology with can, classical CAN and CANFD. Except if you exceed the one embed, then you have to think about an entire redesign, requalification, and so on. So if you just want to make use of the um, length and frame, for example, for um, security reasons to solve security issues, for example, authentication problems, providing the data together with some authentication checksum that you are talking with the um, intended network partners, Maybe this is sufficient if you have no further bandwidth issues and so on. If you um, nevertheless avoid the bitrate switching, this has of course of the protocol and the protocol controller some impact. And we had already at the end of my presentation, um, at the beginning of this event, the question, can I run 
classical CAN and CANFD on the very same wire. What will happen there? And if I run um, or if I enter CAN-based uh, systems, first of all, to discuss this question, we should evaluate which kind of protocol versions do exist now out in the field and maybe I have to work with um, very long-lasting applications like rail vehicles or construction machineries that may run for decades. I have to think about it and be aware that there may be different CAN protocol implementations installed in the devices in the application and I have to deal with them. And therefore let's have a look which kind of protocol implementations do exist very, very old ones. I don't know exactly whether they are really um, used in the field. So, first controller implementation that could only deal with the 11-bit CAN identifier, so the base frame format. Uh, then there existed another generation that was the so-called um, CAN 2.0 B passive. These had been those CAN controllers that were able to communicate the base frame format and would just tolerate uh, the uh, extended frame format, the 29-bit identifier. But since 2003, the publication of these ISO, um, both implementations are no longer compatible, um, compliant to this uh, standard since these days. CAN controllers have to support both frame formats, so the next generation of CAN controllers, they support both frame formats, the 11-bit identifier, the 29-bit identifier, the base frame format, and the extended frame format. And then, during um, uh, the, the CANFD development, came then up the update, the next version of uh, the CAN standard, as I've already introduced to you. And since these days, we have now also the option to provide a CAN controller with a um, so-called um, base frame format or extended frame format in the CAN FD frame format. So also this we have now according um, to CAN FD, these versions. And in addition to this, we have to consider that there exists in the field two different types of CANFD, the early bird implementations, as we call the non-ISO CANFD, and the CANFD implementation that is compliant to the ISO standard. So, um, when I introduce to you CANFD, I have introduced to you also the CFC field and the stuff count field. And the stuff count field is only available in those implementations following the ISO standard 11898-1 from the year 2015. Early implementations that had been made according to um, the first uh, white papers from Bosch with regard to KNFT, they do not support the stuff count field and they are called uh, non-ISO KNFT implementations. And as these frame formats differ, um, there you may occur or run there or figure out there are some incompatibilities if you run both implementations in the very same network. Summing all these protocol versions that might be implemented up in one table, we see it here. And we see here the different data frame formats that may be supported by different CAN implementations. So you see here, let's, let's say laboratory slang, but it's uh, widely used in um, data sheets and so on. And we see here all these different implementations that might be installed in some long-lasting applications. Um, which kind of CAN frames do they support? I mean, which CAN frames they can work? And we see with a classical base frame format, um, you can talk to all the implementations. All implementations can work with the 11-bit CAN identifier in a classical CAN, uh, used in a classical CAN frame. Um, then we see the extended frame format. Um, by the very old ones, it is not accepted by the uh, this 2.20B uh, passive. It is tolerated but not really processed, so you have issues uh, with regard to data consistency and so on. But then all implementations according to the ISO 11898-1 from the year 2003, they can work with both the extended frame format and the base frame format. And both um, frame formats can be processed 
by the KNFD CAN controllers independently whether they are implemented according to the early box specification, the non-ISO KNFD, or according to that what is in the ISO from the year 2015, the ISO KNFD. So as soon as I start communicating with KNFD frames and KNFD frame format, then all the older versions they drop out. Um, if they would receive a KNFD frame, then they would run into an error situation and would trigger um, error frames and you, don't, or you can't set up a proper CAN communication in this case. So at the end, these devices will drop out, will go buzz off and cannot take part any longer in the CAN communication. What about the ISO um, CAN FD and non-ISO CAN FD? Here we see um, they are also incompatible to each other in case they are communicating CAN FD because they differ in the frame format. So um, they exist, for example, ISO CAN FD implementations which have an option to set these implementations into a non-ISO CAN FD mode to make them somehow interoperable so that they can communicate with these um, early bird implementations. Why do they exist? In general, all the, the car makers, when they are using now KNFD, they rely on the ISO KNFD implementation. But these first implementations had already been in the market because um, when the semiconductor manufacturer said, okay, um, we want to implement KNFD, they implemented something, then there came the change and they said, okay, we want to save our invests and therefore we can sell them and can use them, for example, as normal CAN controllers, as classical CAN controllers as well. And so they are in several applications installed, mainly used for classical CAN purposes, but they exist also where they are using KNFD functionality. But be aware, they exist this non-ISO KNFD as well. In general, we are focusing now um, on ISO KNFD and uh, classical CAN. So if you want to have a mixed operation, running both on the very same wire as had been requested um, uh, at the end of my presentation, at the beginning of the event, then we can say as so long as we communicate classical CAN frames, you can have such a mixed operation as illustrated here in the upper part of this slide. So there may coexist classical CAN based devices and CAN FD based devices on the very same wire, you have data consistency and everything, and this is because KNFD based devices can also communicate classical CAN frames. So there everything is alright. The problem occurs as soon as one KNFD based device is issuing a CAN frame coded in the KNFD frame format. Then um, all the classical CAN based devices will detect at least some format errors or something like that and will then send out error frames and destroy the communication. So in such a setup, no proper KNFD communication can run. So you have to think about how can I avoid that classical CAN frames see KNFD frames um, to allow such a setup. And this we see here, there exist already KNFD protection mechanisms in the market, so I have to equip the classical CAN based devices with this protection mechanism and then I have the option to run classical CAN and KNFD on the very same wire with the uh, disadvantage that I have still no data consistency in my network because the classical CAN based devices have no idea which kind of information is exchanged in KNFD coded frames. So this is more or less combining two different networks, a CAN, classical CAN network and a KNFD network on the very same wire. So as I said, there exist already commercially available um, protection methods, for example from company NXP, the so-called uh, KNFD sheet transceiver that translates KNFD frames to um, receive error on, the, um, on this other side, on the side to the CAN controller, to the classical CAN controller. So the classical CAN controller just says, okay, there's something 
uh, some receive errors here, no problem, and I wait till uh, the bus is already um, in an idle state, and then we can communicate further classical CAN frames. <coughs> there exists another solution from company Quarter. I don't know the commercial name, somehow CAN FD bridge or something like that transceiver. Um, and this piece of hardware translates uh, a CAN FD frame into a classical CAN frame with a data length code of zero. So the advantage is that I don't trigger here any error scenarios on the classical CAN controller side. But also in this solution, at the end, I don't have a data consistency. I have more or less two separated networks um, running on the very same physical wire. Uh, if I want to avoid something like that, if I want to have information interchange, I have to think about real bridges combining um, the classical CAN world and the CAN FD world on the data link layer level. And also here we have already some solutions. They exist devices, simple CAN bridges equipped with CAN FD uh, CAN controllers. And in this case, it's very easy to run um, classical CAN frames, FD coded frames, as long as they do not exceed a data size of 8 bytes of data. In this case, I can very simply um, route them from one, or bridge them from one net side to the other, and I have no further issues, a simple forwarding of CAN frames. And the advantage, as I said, I have full in, uh, data consistency, all the devices connected to this network here, the network architecture, have full knowledge um, of the exchange CAN frames. A little more tricky gets the story if I make use of the length and data field of CANFD of byte uh, 9 to 64. Then um, I have to think about on the classical CAN side how to handle this additional data because in a single classical CAN frame there fits only 8 bytes of data. And this means I have to think about some remapping, segmenting and these things. So this gets a little bit more tricky. And let's have a short look at both options. The one is the simple forwarding, the simple bridging. Um, there, I don't have to invent something new because there exists already a CAN automation specification which exactly describes that. It's a specification CR456 and it describes, okay, if I have a configurable bridge with some classical CAN, some CANFD interfaces, for example, then I just um, adjust in the device, okay, which CAN frames, maybe in which identifier range, shall be forwarded from which port to which other port, and that's all I have to do, and then um, the bridging works, and all the data that is routed, uh, forwarded to those uh, network segments which need this kind of information. So nothing to invent anymore. Uh, remains the question, what about the use case if I'm using more than 8 data bytes in a KNFD frame, um, where to forward them and which kind of CAN frames do we have to forward them? And also for this uh, use case, we have already a solution in CAN automation, a corresponding CAN automation specification. It's the specification 302-7 and it describes a so-called shared memory space. So I can have here several interfaces. I have um, to each interface I support a fully can open device and this fully can open device has together with all the other ports a so-called shared memory. These are the so-called system variables. And these system variables um, can be used to receive data from a port, to map it uh, in, in logical entities and to store it in logical entities and to remap these logical entities to process data objects on another port. So this is perfectly for our use case here. We can say, okay, there comes in a receive PDO with 64 bytes and then I store it in the corresponding data elements and then depending on our use cases on another port, we can reassemble the data in a way that is communicated in an appropriate way for the corresponding network segment.
if we are already using 3R2-7, and as I've said, normally they would uh, require fully can open devices on each side, we could directly go this way that we say, why not running on the higher layers here our can open stack? So nobody prevents you from running a classical can open stack on a KNFD controller, for example. The only restriction that you have is that you say, okay, maybe you don't make use of the 64 byte that you may have in a, <coughs> in a, a KNFD frame, but you say, okay, I'm just using 8 byte, and then you can run a classical can open stack without any changes on KNFD. We have already seen at the beginning of the presentations that you always get here some advantages when you accelerate uh, with a communication speed. You gain some uh, data throughput. And in this case, you can use all the existing and open specifications um, without any changes. So you would have here on the higher layer a fully transparent can open network and you just don't care that part of the um, information are communicated via KNFD networks. I just don't see it on a higher layer. And this enables us, as I said, for example, to use the year 3 2 7 And this would solve a lot of um, a lot of challenges. I have fully can open device interfaces on every port of such a gateway or router device. And then I can come back to my challenge, how to combine the classical CAN world and the CANFD world. I have now my CAN open services. I can have a simple forwarding for boot up, for emergency, for sync, for PDOs, and so on. And I have my object dictionary here, and I can use all the functionalities I'm used to use from CAN open, and I can also use my tooling um, with a corresponding can open interpretation. And as I said, it helps us already the 3 or 2 7 to receive also larger data. Then I need some slight changes. For example, um, for PDOs, I have to change the evaluation threshold that I cannot just map 8 byte but 64 byte um, to a PDO and then I can use the entire mapping mechanisms and everything more as I explained previously to this slide. Furthermore, the 302-7 explains us that a gateway or router application also owns an object dictionary. We see here the object dictionary entries. We can adjust here network IDs to our ports. We can have cost structures, what is a very beneficial communication interface, which is another one uh, which I use only in case of doubt because it may be heavy loaded. And furthermore, the main part are the system variables which allow the data exchange between different networks connect, interconnected via such a gateway application. As I have such an object dictionary now, also the SDO communication would be enabled. All data that have to be exchanged can be stored in these system variables and therefore it's available on all the interfaces. This means on the classical CAN side I can make an SDO read and get my response and on the other side I can do the same. I can make the SDO write, get the confirmation and this way I can transfer, for example, the data from this CAN FD side to this classical CAN base side. And the 302-7 allows us also um, to make the gateway somehow transparent that I can say, okay, maybe from the classical CAN side I have now the ability to indicate I don't want to communicate with the gateway, but with the backline network I do something that is called an SDO network indication. I give the port number, the node ID of the device to which I like to talk, and this is just a kind of prologue to my average can open SDO communication and therefore I've opened the door to the entire backline world behind such a gateway application. Here we see this um, illustrated. I sent my remote indication to the gateway and then I have a fully throughput here to this device and I can access this can open device based on KNFT hardware. So 
something like that is already possible with that that is standardized in the CR specifications. Nevertheless, we have already learned, okay, um, if we map here on the KNFD side uh, classical can open stack, then it cannot make fully use of the 64 byte data throughput. There are still some limitations. That's clear because uh, the classic can open stack has been designed for classic can and not for KNFD. Therefore, if I want to make full use of KNFD in such a migration situation, then I should opt for something that is a can open FD application layer in this example. So I can open optimized for the use of KNFD and for KNFD data frames with a, a payload of up to 64 byte. So in this situation, we, we have now the case that we're using two different application layers, can open and can open FD. <coughs> and to solve such a situation, this means I have to think about network access services for the can open FD side to access via gateway application the can open side. This is a typical use case that we know from our well known uh, specification 309. So we could say that we are using the well defined network access services, which we have already used to allow Modbus. Um, Profinet I.O. or some web services access to CanOpen. We could then use as well for CanOpen FD. So this could be an option. I have written it in gray because I don't think that we will really do it. We will do something else, I think, because we will evaluate CanOpen and CanOpen FD and we will see a lot of things are rather similar. CanOpen is very scalable. And why not just dropping out some small elements to make can open, can open FD capable? And so we have the option to combine both worlds and something like that, I think, will be also presented later on by my colleague, Mr. Kaplun. So for the moment, we see this is just an option that could work. I don't think that we will follow this option, but <coughs> I think we will follow that option in a way that we say, okay, maybe a 3 or 2-7 plus where we say, um, how to translate specific services uh, that exist in CanOpen on the CanOpen FD side. So that we say, okay, they exist for some the SDO on CanOpen, they exist in an updated CanOpen FD instead a so-called universal service data object, a USDO, and then we say, okay, then we can directly translate an SDO to a USDO and enable therefore via a gateway functionality the access. And the other way, the same round as the USDO, as we will learn later on, has the full function coverage of the uh, classical can open SDO. We can also use an USDO to make an access on the can side in a more efficient way. The tricky thing is now that an USDO has an additional functionality compared to the SDO. So we have the option to um, access several devices at the very same time with one single access. So this means, as it is already described in 309-5, that we have here the possibility that we give to the gateway a task, the gateway works one access after the other, it gives us then the summary of um, the accesses that the gateway had fulfilled here, um, initiated via our first USDO access. So we can here hand over very complex USDO commands and get them one result. So the details will be presented then by my colleague, Mr. Kaplun. What are the details about the new USDO, what we can do there? And I just want to indicate here at the moment that also such can open, can open if the gateways are already commercially available. So there has been a presentation I think um, on the um, embedded world, I don't know whether it had been just planned or whether they have now um, done it also in a, in a, in a, in a how's it called, um, virtual fair because of the limitations of the last embedded world because of Corona. Um, nevertheless, they have also some uh, presentations in our international CAN conference proceedings where they say, okay, we have such a gateway available between can open and can open FD. So um, if somebody is interested in these solutions, 
please refer once again to our proceedings from the International CAN Conference, which are for purchase at CAN and Automation Office. This was just an example for CAN Open and CAN Open FD. These kind of migration paths exist also for J939, so especially, uh, especially Holger is there, engaged accompanies the update of J939 uh, to, uh, to make use of KNFD. So in laboratory slang we call the J9039 uh, FD. In uh, specification words it's I think J903922. And there exist others as well. Higher protocols that are already updated and there are um, some gateway applications could solve these issues. Okay, so for the moment um, I hope I could give you a lot of ideas how you could use existing technology, existing specifications for finding your best migration path from classical CAN networks to KNFD based networks, how to combine both technologies and um, the, the major or the basic problem is that classical CAN and KNFD are not really compatible to each other as soon as you communicate with KNFD frames then um, classical CAN based devices will for, be forced to go into an error scenario. Therefore, we have several solutions for implementing such a migration path. I have shown several ones. I hope it had been uh, beneficial for you. Now there's coming a next uh, question here. Is mixing CANFD and classical CAN frames on the same network allowed? Yes, as I have shown, it is allowed. Um, but therefore, uh, I like to remind you at the beginning of this uh, presentation here. So, if as soon as a classical uh, a KNFD frame is received by a classical CAN controller, this CAN controller goes into an error scenario. Therefore, you have to protect this classical CAN frame from seeing KNFD frames. How you do this is part of your migration solution. So whether you switch these devices off in this use case because you can do so because you have uh, you just need KNFD for firmware updates and so on and very specific application scenarios. Others are these measures like KNFD shield transceivers. Other measures are bridges and gateways. So um, in the next half an hour, Mr. Kaplun will present us uh, a short introduction uh, with regard to KNOPNFD. So. Uh, Mr. Kaplun is a CAN automation, um, also a technical manager active, and he updates also the CAN Open FD documents, especially those for device description and testing. So, Oscar, please start. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Healthy and wealthy, I hope. So, um, my part actually regards to new technology we introduced a couple of years back, can open FD. It's already told something in a previous presentations about it. So can open FD is application layer for whatever you actually want to have. So, as you already know, all communication system uh, consists of seven standardized layers and all together build this communication, any communication system. The same applies also for embedded systems, although we need uh, no uh, human to human communication there. So some layers are actually not necessary. As you see now from this slide, there are only three layers available. This is physical layer, data link layer, and finally the application layer, which we will discuss in further details there. Having only these three layers actually save some development time and give you a hint um, how would you uh, design your system. And the idea behind this one for embedded systems is actually to have a standardized data interface between 
various devices of various manufacturers so they could connect them together and they will operate in uh, the typical um, embedded network. Since we're talking about Canopen FT, the layers of uh, these ISO communication systems, ISO OC communication model, are actually independent, can be used independently from each other. So below Canopen, you can actually use not only CanFD data link layer and not only Can FD physical layer or whatsoever. You can put actually whatever you need. So it's pretty universal. But why we have chosen CanFD and CanFD physical layer and data link layer? The choice is simple. They are actually optimized for use in a very specific embedded system design and can open FT will be optimized to use this um, subsequent layers, this can FT and can FT physical layer. This is not the only uh, idea behind this. We have already can open, which exist was developed 25 years ago and successfully um, emerge in various uh, embedded markets. So we say, hey, why should we throw this away and say, uh, do something completely new? We just improve what we have before. So take what we had in Canopen and see how we can fit into CanFT data link layer and CanFT physical layer. I basically say, what do these layers require and how can I get advantage of it? So this is why we chosen, uh, we developed this one beside of course the, the point our members said, okay, we have now new shiny microcontrollers with enormous resources and power so it's supporting CanFT controllers whatsoever. And why not? Why should we use just Kinopen on it when we can completely utilize and adopt our new application layer protocol to this exactly CanFT faster and longer frames? We start actually layer by layer. There are only three. I think there's not too much time to spend on each other, on each, uh, on each of those. And then we check out why should we use it and what are the advantages of each of this layer in details. So as this was already spoken, um, physical layer, data link layer, so the speed is important there. CanFT, in contrary to the other CAN technologies, require not uh, more than two, more than one bit rate, and they have to be uh, combined together in a very certain manner. Otherwise, it wouldn't work anyways. So, beside this fact that uh, there is a, there are two bit rates nominal and data bitrate pairs required. We said, why should we not uh, actually do improve the interoperability and actually the compatibility of the devices and even uh, increase their level of uh, standardization so that you could purchase them and receive, get the same, all the same data inside from there and having the same and very same or very close operating parameters such as bit rates. So we said for Canopen, we don't define uh, some bit rates for whatever and everybody can pick up at least one. No, we chose another way said, we specify the mandatory pairs which every device should have. So, and above it, everybody can actually took 
the take the peak and um, may also support additional bit rates whatsoever. But every device would support for uh, mandatory, as you can see in the table below, for mandatory bit rate pairs. And actually, if I'm connecting them into network, because this is actually everything about network integration, then I would just select uh, one bit rate and I know that all the other devices support it. The design itself is, however, a little bit tricky, but we come up with for that. We have already de defined, we have provided recommendations how to do, how to design the network communication in can open FT networks and about this a little bit uh, later. So we have specifications which actually was done for CanFD, but as you know, the physical layer is the same also for CanOpen. So the most things would apply the same. So you could just take the SIA 600 specifications with their recommendation for device and design system design and could just apply to your embedded Canopen FD network and device. So, so far about bit rates, as I said, there are mandatory, some mandatories, they are also possible to uh, some additional. And there will be also possibility actually to do is completely manufacture specific, although we don't recommend it as the specification itself, this CR3 uh, uh, <clears throat> 1301 has the fixed one and some already existing, which you can combine with each other. So we're not actually encouraged to completely manufacture specific bit timing because it would uh, lead to the incompatibility of the devices and a lesser compatibility in the network. So it was already spoken in the previous um, slides about uh, impact of CanFT, communication CanFT frames, CanFT protocols on higher layer protocols. And what are the advantages of longer and um, faster CAN frames such as CanFT? There was talk about software downloads, um, firmware updates, program operation, program uploads, and so on. There will be um, exchange of process data on the level not seen before with can open or even can based can open. You could pretty n utilize uh, the capability of can open, increase them but you could also do this completely different. So thanks to 64 bytes on data, you could put whenever, whatever you wish, and you're not restricted, you're not limited to the previous constraints bound the Kenobi networks. So there could be also improvement toward big data communication, sensor data communication, where we're pushing the data over the cloud to the end user. There will be condition monitoring more effectively done as well, is since it would require higher payload and more faster data exchange. And of course, we do not uh, offer the technology which cannot uh, offer simply, simplified development. So this is why the migration path was chosen also to use between classical Kenopen and Kenopen FD. So as I said, this all, uh, everything is based actually on Kenopen. It is improvement of Kenopen, although some things we can do completely different. So uh, because we have to adopt this to KenFT, and not only adopt SIG, and we seek actually the advantages which we can gain from the higher payload and uh, faster data transmission, 
uh, the new, completely new protocols could emerge, uh, emerge on it. But for now, we also keep in mind that migration path, meaning actually development, reduction of development cost, is also the topic in this case. So in this slide, you can see actually um, can open FT basic protocols we design. And um, they are based actually on existing can open protocols which we have uh, utilized and see how we can reuse them and uh, get advantage of using them using the higher payload of KNFD. They are transport protocols and there are also network management protocols. As of right now, it is one-to-one -one except USTO is um, absolutely equal protocols on it themselves the only difference, this is a payload we can transmit with them, we can transfer with them. So most the advantage uh, received their transport protocols, which transport the data for whatever reason it might be. And also in this case, emergency protocol where we can, uh, this is a special uh, purpose protocol which used to diagnose the network um, functionality, network function, and um, inform the, all participants in the network if something went wrong, what is the reason for that, and so on. There is also process data communication. This is um, KNFT 101. Uh, this is just pure data transmission. And finally, we have universal service data object where we could use the configuration and maybe upload and download higher, uh, uh, larger pieces of software, like for software download, firmware update, and so on. So the transport protocols, as you can see, could more the advantages, most advantages from um, KNFT. So in order to uh, reduce the development cost for this, we set network management, although they will be transmitted with KNFT, shouldn't be that exaggerated and use the full extent of 64 bytes. They could be also the same, absolutely the same, since they provide very limited information. It could be, shouldn't be, shouldn't be actually redesigned, I could use as they are. The point is here to understand that the error control protocols, which you can see there below, which uh, serves actually to um, recognize the current state of the device in the network and monitor the condition if the devices are available in the network is due to certain uh, circumstances, which we learn in the next slide. Uh, there is only one protocol available, it's this heartbeat protocol. The other guarding protocol, which was used in KinOpen, is not uh, any longer available there. And um, you have to design your systems only with this consideration. So there could be a kind of um, manufactured designed um, guarding, but that will be not a standardized solution. So we said there is only one uh, error control protocol that should be heartbeat. Beside that, we have boot up protocol, NMT message network, so on, timestamp for um, providing time information throughout the network and synchronization protocol for synchronizing of the participant on the network, the nodes, in a time when they would like to send the data or receive the data. So just the basic protocols, you see we took them from CanOpen and uh, we just improve them where they can be and especially that regards to uh, PDO and USTO, they mostly use transport protocols. 
We start with PDO. It is almost uh, the same beside the higher payload, a uh, large chunk of data can be transmitted with, them, with that. As we said, um, in Kenopen, it was also possible to transmit only one to eight byte. Now we have H time bigger. So the transmission can be done event triggered or synchronous or periodic and so on. That you could read in a corresponding specification 1301. We had in Knopen actually remote transmission message, which was supported by CAN message, uh, by CAN protocol. Now we don't have it anymore. So in Knopen FT, remote frames are not supported due to CANFT. But actually you would, you can uh, do design certain uh, trigger conditions, maybe transmit some uh, PDO which could serve as a trigger condition for this one. So despite the fact that RTR is no more available due to the uh, nature of CANFD protocol, you could always uh, mimic its ability in Canopen network. This is, of course, the special one special thing which you might have uh, find necessary and use in your device in a system for this, this very special reason. But again, the RTA is not supported, although you can design your own um, RTA mimicking using the simple PDO message frame and so on. The next one would be USTO. So see where well, the time is go on. So it was too quick <laughs> to Two less a time left, but I will try to uh, get all the information I wanted to say today. So now we come to the very interesting part, uh, universal STO. So in Kenopen we had, uh, we have actually STO. Just to mention that Kenopen remains as it is. We just have an additional protocol, uh, protocol set called now Kenopen FT but can open the remains as it is and quite um, effectively used in this. So STO has some dis certain disadvantages, uh, although for uh, existing can open systems, can open devices and systems, we could pretty overcome them and work in a certain, uh, with a certain constraints and design certain um, uh, device functionality with it. So, but we said, hey, okay, in Kenopen FT, we have an opportunity to improve what uh, STO lacked or hadn't had and uh, do um, design advanced capabilities, which are actually not possible due to the nature of CAN protocol, which was in Kenobe. These all features are actually listed there. There could be uh, some others coming later, but the most important one is for reducing the configuration is this, that uh, the sender of the message, of the USDO message, it goes to both ways, two ways actually. It decides based on this node ID, who is this actually? Is this a client or a server? So STO is, was actually always uh, designed, the configuration is have to be adjusted to the, US, to the STO server. We had only one channel and uh, we had always uh, to configure this stuff. Now we don't need to do that much because every sender communicates on its own channel and uses its own node ID. So the communication configuration is reduced in this case. Since the same uh, for STO, we need certain um, transmission where we send only few 
chunks of data, if it is only simple parameter, or maybe we would like to make some uh, downloads of firmware or download some uh, bigger parameters somewhere and so on. And for this reason, STO had also advanced protocols. The Expedite, it was used for 32-bit longer transmission and above it was segmented and block transfer. Since we have 64 bytes in KNFT and we say we wanted to keep it uh, simple, we said we said that the same three or similar concepts were we taken from, um, from KNOPEN, but used in this case here and we call it expedited segmented bulk transfer. For various types of downloads, we check this out later. We have some slides uh, um, for that. And I will shortly uh, describe what the other very important and interesting features. It is possible actually to access uh, one and the same uh, device and actually is called the server functionality in this device, we get address at and at the same time, not in the same time, but in a certain um, sequence, um, upload and download data from the very same USD server. It was not possible in KinOpen. Then we can route the data throughout several networks, which was possible with um, can open only um, under condition that you use specific hardware component called a special router and so on because has uh, can can open supported only uh, one network and if I have even small network and would like to access the network over several networks throughout several networks. I have limited access. I have only a few um, node IDs that I could assign and the routing was a little bit tricky. Now the routing is incorporated into USTO protocol itself. So we see it then. So the one important, however not yet exploited feature is the multiple sub-index access allows me actually to do a configuration if I put my um, configuration parameter into one object in one can open index and into its various sub-indexes. But it's not yet uh, designed actually in the very recent ver released version of specification for can open FT, this 1301 but it is coming up uh, very soon. So there is of course physical addressing. We could address network and node. Uh, and the network is bound to the routing capability. So I get, uh, could uh, transmit the data across networks because the data is already the um, information is incorporated in uh, protocol which network should I access in this case. And beside this one, we detail defined um, USDO abort codes for very specific reasons. We have grouped them into certain categories so you could um, clearly identify what was the problem actually. And in a the picture there, you could see how this protocol works works similar to UST, to STO. However, as we said, there is no need to configure every device for accessing the server, for accessing the data in another device, because it has to use its own node ID. Now on the three next slides, you can just check out, sorry, was too quick. We check out very quickly about expedited, segmented, and bulk transfer. They are pretty um, different ones. With the expedite is similar to the Istio based one. However, imagine that 64 bytes could transmit much more than 
only eight data bytes. So the very important stuff here, the very important thing here is that we put all the configuration instead of ex external parameters, which were indexes of CanOpen for STO, we put this configuration in the data frame because we have now more than, uh, we have more than eight bytes. So we have some bytes uh, additionally, so we could just do that. So as you can see various fields there, destination address, command specifier, session ID, sub index, index, data type, size. So what do they mean? More exactly you could find in a specification, I just uh, give an overview on the, over them. Destination address is, tells me where to come and what kind of communication do I have. So the difference is actually I could do not only point-to-point -point communication as was done in uh, can open, but I could do this multicast and even broadcast. Imagine the capability, the possibilities open now. So the command specifier, as it was also similar in STO, does give me information what kind of transfer it is. Are I download, upload data, what kind of uh, transfer is that? Is it expedited, segmented, or whatever it might be? The session ID is an important one, gives me an opportunity to clearly distinguish between the accesses of each, of each data request, let's say. So this is all about this parallel access I mentioned before, this is session ID. This is clearly identifies, I send the data and receive with the same session ID, I know, okay, this data comes back for me exactly for this request. If I start several parallel access, so due to the different session ID is returned, I exactly know to which one they belong. Subindex and index were already there, so we just put them as they should be. And there are also two additional things which were not available there before in STO and in Kenopen. This is data type and size. What do they give me? They give me actually how big um, my data can be, and another one, how big is it really? How much of this data I'm actually using? So pretty much uh, information in one message, but it helps me exclusively reduce configuration of my device and for application I operate, I actually pretty sure, pretty know, pretty exactly know what is expected there, what data should come there and how big it is. Back uh, to um, the response is actually not necessary to be the same big as it was actually in CanOpen. So we said we put only the necessary information this is not only migration path, um, it is less there, but they say reducing of the uh, bus traffic. So we said the response would be sl smaller. This effectively increase our data throughout put through the networks. So then I go pretty quickly about other protocols, segmented and bulk transfer. As you see, in both of those, we use um, data frame for storing the configuration itself. And the difference between segmented transfer and bulk transfer is for large uh, chunks of data, firmware update, whatever might be, very big data. So we transmit the data and receive confirmation as a STO or UCO protocol works actually. This point-to-point -point connection, confirmed point-to-point -point connection. After each data chunk, I get um, confirmation of it. And so on uh, until I do all data put. You see, we can actually save this um, confirmation 
if we know actually the uh, consistency of the data is actually uh, satisfiable. And this is where we come to another protocol, this is bulk transfer. As you can see, I can send the data all throughout and after I get all the necessary data or say at least a big block of data, I could submit a confirmation that saves time effectively increases uh, payload and time, time for the data transmission. There is only other protocol. Ah, okay, this is a, a long distance USTO is actually this uh, network um, based one where you can transmit the data throughout the networks. You can look into details in the specification. I just mentioned that the destination uh, of the uh, device where I send the data is also containing the network information where which network it should be um, originated, should be uh, directed to, and um, the device which should be addressed. So pretty every information about addressing throughout the networks is done in there. So. So we finished with USTO. Now we have network diagnostics, emergency protocol. We actually encapsulate this emergency we had already. So this is the migration path as well. We encapsulate it in the bytes, as you can see from this uh, picture. This is an um, emergency message now for CanOpenFD. You can see byte four to 11 actually contains the canopen uh, based emergency information. But since we could improve it very uh, big time and said, okay, we could know, could learn, actually could uh, inform which part of device, which device actually supplies this emergence. So we had several devices in, we had these logical devices with virtual devices in application profiles, logical devices in device profiles. And we actually never knew in CanOpen what is behind this emergency, which part of the device or uh, this uh, configuration or control entity actually uh, transmits or generates this data, this emergency information. Now we know this, and for this reason, the first byte is logical device number. We know exactly for logic for device profiles where this emergency originate from. We also can adopt uh, the specification number, so we know which emergency version is designed from which, which part, because they could be very and very different from others. There are certain information like status and time, which uh, are pretty, um, pretty informative to know about the emergency. If there's be, be, beside a diagnostic, provides some advanced features, some advanced data. Is this error actually, um, hard and um, is actually not repairable. We finished with actually with features of KinOpenFT and I would like to say some words. There's all things are providing specification, but there is some things to do about um, advanced protocols we have not designed yet, but we're working on it. We want to do conformance test plan, electronic device description, physical layer description, so ever. I want to check up if can open FD we designed actually foolproof for the future protocols. For this reason, actually there are technical groups which are actually do this work for can open FD. If you want to participate in them, welcome to join there. So, when you device, design your device, so you need to describe uh, the features of the device. In KinOpenFT, in contrary to KinOpen, the only way to do so is XML-based. We're currently developing this one, 
and it should be technology independent and it is done according to standardized position, standardized profile description in XML, as you can see for EtherCAD, Ethernet, PowerLink and other protocols, we can reuse it and we do it actually. So the last but not, uh, the least but not last, can operate the device testing. We don't have a test actually, but we have already a test procedure. If you're starting device, starting to design can open FT device, we can test it already. And even provide a testing procedure for you if you want to check up how much and how well does it work. So far, I'm coming to summary overview, specification is there, recommendation for network design, migration path more or less. We have device and application profiles, which will be in the next, uh, actually in the next presentation from Mr. Selvange, he talks, uh, he will talk about the profiles in details. So then device testing is available, as I said in previous one, and we check actually their compatibility of KinOpenFT for new technologies like CanExcel as well. So thank you, Oscar, and uh, then I'd like to hand over uh, to uh, Mr. Zellweger, who will uh, provide us now an insight into the Can Open Profiles update. So Mr. Salzwanger, he's the managing director of the Canon Automation Association and run for a long uh, of years or even I think more than two decades um, also uh, the Canon Automation Company. So for the moment, thank you, Holger. Stage is yours. So uh, as already said, I'm uh, doing this uh, since 1992 as the managing director of the CIA. I'm also in the meantime um, in several committees of the ISO, the convener, and I'm expert in other um, ISO and IEC groups and also member of the SAE. So at the end, I have three hats, the CIA hat, of course, then I have an ISO hat sometimes, and last but not least, I have also an SAE hat. So uh, I'm a three hat uh, gentleman, and uh, Depending on what I'm talking about uh, today, I'm talking about uh, can open profiles. I have the CIA hat on. Okay, let's go to that. First of all, I like to have some definitions. So I think that not everybody is very familiar with the um, with profiles and what that means. So in general, profiles are a set of parameters representing process variables, configuration data, uh, and diagnostic information. To go to some specific profiles, we have uh, we distinguished between three profile or kinds of profile. The device profiles are a set of parameters specifying the functional behavior of one dedicated device. So we describe the device and its functional behavior. In application profiles, which are similar to that what SIE and J939 is doing or other um, uh, J939 based um, approaches in the uh, ISOBUS uh, field for agriculture machines, we define a set of parameters specifying a complete system by means of virtual devices. So this doesn't matter where this is implemented, we describe the entire application with a predefined behavior and some options of course, and this is the opposite of the device profile. The third kind of profile is the interface profile. This is more or less a set of parameters specifying the communication behavior of a gateway device without application functionality. I will give you some examples on that and what we are developing and what uh, is ongoing. You can have also some human analogies for that. The device profile is that where you have a dictionary with all the vocabulary and it describes what this means. And it may have also some uh, dedicated vocabulary. For example, uh, the communication, what is needed for a waiter and a guest or a doctor and a patient. Also, always from a viewpoint of one person. The application profile, this describes or specifies the talk between multiple persons using predefined phrases, e.g. a project manager, salespeople, manufacturing staff, bookkeeper, human resource manager, marketing ex experts. 
So you have the entire communication predefined what they are normally are saying. And of course, this can be configured. And last but not least, we have the interface profile. <clears throat> this is really for interpreters, how to interpret uh, a word in English to German language or vice versa. So that is some ideas that you get um, <clears throat> what we're talking about when we have the profiles. So we don't deal with the grammar rules. We just deal with the vocabulary and predefined sentences. You can regard this also in a different analogy, like uh, the profile approach, the device profile approach is like a classic orchestra. So you have then the conductor, who is the master of the system, and you have the, the slave devices uh, in Ken Open, which are the musicians, and they play the music depending on the uh, uh, conductor who is guide them through the um, different um, operas or, or uh, concerts. If you look at this in, uh, in technical terms, you see that is the, the programmable application master, which also hosts the NMT uh, functionality, the NMT master functionality, and <clears throat> sends and collects all the PDOs. The configuration of the slave devices is done by SDOs. So this approach or this kind of system designs is described by um, the device profiles and we call this decentralized control systems. We use for that the predefined uh, Kane ID set. So we have for any of the uh, provided protocols, we have a function code and we have the resulting identifier depending on the node uh, ID which is assigned to the slave. And so you know which ID you have to use. <clears throat> this makes it very simple and this is for the lazy system designers. Of course, this is allowed to optimize things, in particular the, PDO optimize, uh, the PDOs. You can change the priority, you can change um, the behavior that is only just received by the or, or sent to the um, master, NMT master node. We can have also multi and broadcasting. We can have a different PDO scheduling and also we can change the mapping. So you are still have the flexibility in, with the device profile approach to optimize your PDO communication. Or you can do it differently, like an adjustment. You still have a band leader who is the NMT master. And you have some other people, experts uh, with their uh, music and they can even interact by means of predefined PDO communication. This means if you have a typical jazz, uh, jam session, then uh, two musicians without the band leader can communicate and or make music, uh, or in case of uh, can open networks, they can, com com can communicate without the NMT master device. So you see here, you have three programmable controllers. We call this distributed control system. And in this small application, the um, programmable master uh, with, uh, in, on the NMT slave A is configuring uh, the device C and the NMT slave B, which is also a, a programmable master, um, application master, it is responsible for the uh, NMT slave E. And uh, the other, uh, the third one, who is the overall master, they, uh, he is responsible to configure the, the other programmable uh, application masters and the slave device D. So you can have a completely um, independent running system with predefined communication between, depending on your application. We use this in, for example, in <clears throat> those uh, applications like lift control systems. Here, in this case, uh, with the application profiles, do you don't have predefined, uh, by mean, uh, predefined PDOs by means of or deriving from the node ID. Here, any of the 512 uh, PDOs um, are application profile specific defined, and the other can open functionality is, of course, the same as before. Okay, uh, from the beginning, CIA was committed uh, to specified profiles, because we think that most of the users are not only interested in standardizing the grammar, but also the vocabulary or even predefined sentences. 
The first device profiles um, was already developed in the early 90s or mid of 90s. This was the CIA 41 uh, IO module profile, a drives a motion control um, profile, which is in the meantime internationally standardized and so on. The application profiles also was very early uh, adopted by CIA uh, in the uh, passenger information system in 1998 and of the 90s and followed by in, in the earlier uh, 2000 years in for lift control systems, for refuse collecting vehicles, and so on. Interface profiles uh, came a little bit later. In 2006, we have had one for the ASI gateway, and now we have it just released last year for IO-Link, another gateway specification. So yes, that you have directly access to all those sub-layered networks with all the different devices in that. The complete list of the CanOpen profile specification is available on our website and you can look um, that we have about 50 different uh, profiles um, released and uh, some of them have even parts. So it's a lot of documents. I think in total it's more than 20,000 pages. Last year we started to think about again about our profile approach and we decided uh, to um, have in the future uh, one part uh, of these profiles as an application layer independent profile. This means this can be adapted by different application layers. Of course, first of all, we thought that the classic can open and the can open FD are two different application layers, and we need two mappings for that. Of course, we can describe this all in one document, but then we detected that also others may be interested. Uh, so uh, like J9039, also if this is desired, then we also can have a mapping to J9039 of the basic, uh, of the base uh, functionality of such a profile. The idea was not very new. Uh, it was already in the beginning of the year 2000 that we offered other organizations uh, to have uh, such uh, bus independent profiles specified so that the interoperability between uh, the different devices is very easy and it doesn't matter how you transport the data. But this was not adopted by, by many of them. Uh, some of them have done, like uh, PowerLink uh, and uh, Ethercat, they have adopted some of our profiles, but not all of them. And sometimes um, they are, uh, have, in the meantime, slightly different uh, specifications. The first profile which we have um, developed uh, with this approach was the interface profile for IO-Link gateways. Such gateways, gateways may host multiple I.O. link connections. In one I.O. link master, 16 master ports are available so that we uh, have that then on the side uh, of, the, of the CAN side, the process data is mapped to PDOs. And the PDOs can have eight bytes in case of CAN open or they have 16, 64 bytes in case of uh, CAN open FD. We have uh, done both of these specifications. It was uh, the first time that we have started with that. And uh, to see if can we, we can use this approach also for other profiles. The CIA 463 CS is not only applicable for uh, extendable bus coupler, uh, it's also a, um, applicable for extended bus coupler with an internal backbone, for example, for, slides, for sliced IOs multi-access server drives with each access having independent operation modes, etc. The second uh, profile which uh, follows the new uh, CIA profile specification approach is uh, CIA 406 encoder profile. The version 4.1 um, uh, has been released last year. It, pro it provides some improvements regarding the CLC polyn polynomial for can open safety applications. Additional, additionally, some parameters for function safety have been introduced. And the Annex C provides examples for the can open safety configuration handling. This is important because not everybody is so familiar and we have uh, had in the beginning no examples, but I think this was, is very valuable to have to guide the people and give some ideas how to configure uh, those uh, safety encoders. 
What is new, and uh, this is um, already uh, close to be released, is the CIA 406-J specification. It maps the profile of encoders, linear as well as uh, rota uh, rotary encoders, to SIE J939. The PDOs are mapped to eight byte parameter groups. If you're familiar with J939, any uh, of these uh, parameter groups has a uh, length of eight bytes. For example, the position. And then we have the encoder configuration parameters. We want still to configure, as in can open, uh, the, uh, the encoder devices, even if they support uh, J939. So we have the CAM11 and the CAM21 parameter groups. They are specified in CIA 510, and they map the SDO, the classical CAN SDO, into uh, uh, these uh, J939 uh, J uh, parameter groups. And so you can configure, and you have virtually also the object dictionary available. The same parameters, anything is the same. You just can use your configuration tools and your, your configuration um, software which you have written uh, for Keno, Classic can Open also now by January 39. In order to, uh, to map also the emergency parameter, we have uh, requested a parameter group for emergencies, which is also an eight byte uh, direct one-to-one -one mapping from can Open emergency message to the uh, J939 message. The same approach as for the encoder, we have also done for the inclinometer, profile, CIA 410, and the, the, this will also be released soon. Both uh, profiles for encoder and inclinometers are heavily used in uh, construction machines and other off-road and off-highway vehicles. And uh, because uh, J939 do not provide uh, such profiles for generic encoders and inclinometers, now they are able to use the CanOpen um, products with another interface, just the vocabulary is still the same. Another profile which we have uh, released recently is uh, for weighing devices, and well, we have updated this and improved. Part one and part two, this is the PDO specification in part one, and the part two uh, has the specification for load cells. Uh, they were originally published in 2015 and have been uh, updated, but just um, marginally, and for uh, just a few changes have been introduced. More important for the new release of this series was the completion of the, of the profile series, and the new part three specified the can open interface for scales. This was not done in the first release of uh, version. This includes the process data and the mapping into PDOs as well as configuration parameters. And the new part four provides the device profile for weighing displays and indicators. And they also specify the process data and the necessary configuration parameters. Additionally, it describes the PDO communication and mapping parameters. So now you have a complete system for weighing devices based on different uh, device profiles for all kind of, uh, from load cells via um, the uh, scales and the displays and indicators. A lot of our profiles are in review. The CIA 41 series, which is the most implemented one, is now split in different documents. As I said, uh, in the base uh, document where the functionality is described, uh, application layer independent, than for uh, can open which is already existing and we're specifying this also for can open fd and oscar has mentioned this that this is something what is ongoing and we do this for many other um, of our profiles as well cia 402 series is under systematic review in the iec and uh, of course there will be also a, a can open fd mapping uh, but not part of the IC standard. This is a separate document uh, within the CIA uh, series of CIA 402 uh, specifications.
On the systematic reviews are a lot of other profiles um, from battery charger, laboratory automation, photovoltaic, low voltage switch gear devices, container handling devices, RFID devices, pumps, drilling machines. All those different profiles are under review. We are a little bit in delay because of the coronavirus, uh, so we have not started it in, in spring. We will start this uh, in late spring, but still we hope that we will finish uh, some of them uh, quite uh, within the summer or in autumn. And all these profiles will be moved to the draft standard state. Some of them are still in the, uh, in the, in the disk state, uh, which means um, that they, they are not uh, available from uh, for, for uh, not that stable. Okay, uh, just to give you an idea on the profile specification process and which states we have. When we start with a profile, this is just in work draft. And the doc, uh, the, those documents should not be implemented because they are still under development. When we, uh, these uh, work drafts are somehow mature, then we release them as drafts in the proposals and they are only accessible for CIA members. Documents are frozen for around one year, and then we can get as a feedback uh, experiences from the first implementations. After this has been done and we have uh, improved the documents, and this happens uh, sometimes many years after they have been um, released for, uh, as uh, DSPs, but then we're going uh, uh, to release them as draft standards. And those documents are rather mature and may be subscribed also by non-members. And if, if they have been implemented by many companies and are very mature, then we release them public and you can download them free of charge. Several of them are downloadable free of charge. You just uh, browse through the CI website and you see what you can get. And if you need a younger document, then you can subscribe to the series of uh, profile specifications or you become a member. The interest group profiles, which we have inaugurated last year, uh, this is, coordinates all the special interest groups and related task forces and approves the drafts and the documents developed so that there's no double specification and that they have a, the same look and feeling. And um, the IG is also respons is responsible for all these documents and also some of the application notes related to those profile specifications. The active uh, special interest groups uh, belonging to the uh, IG profiles are the um, SIG for I.O. devices, uh, for drives and motion control, for encoder and inclinator, they have been combined, and for energy management system, fluid power, I.O. link, uh, lift control systems, uh, for measuring devices, for municipal vehicles, car at on devices, and the weighing devices and systems. We also have some dormant special interest groups because they have not uh, had meetings for a long time for power supply, for truck gateway, for uh, rail vehicles, and for torque control, and for SAPSI. The SAPSI has closed because they have finished their, uh, more or less their um, specification. But if there's a need for a new sensor uh, for the SAPSI applications, of course, then we will reawake the dormant uh, six. How you can get profiles? First idea is become a member then you have access to any of the CI documents, including profile specification from work drafts to draft standards. Okay, you can also wait. Then you can download the public documents free of charge uh, from CI's website. And uh, yeah, or if you uh, want, uh, don't want to be a member, but still want to have access to the profile documents, then you can subscribe to the CIA 400 series. This is a one-year subscription for all CIA specifications in draft standard state. The annual price is uh, about 1,000 euro, and you should decide if this is um, uh, what you like to spend or it's more easy for you to become a member. Um, this is the last presentation of today. Uh, it is regarding the uh, Canix L um, 
third Cane data link layer generation. And when I started uh, the CIA, I was, um, this was, that was the first generation, just the, that what is now called classical CAN. And in 2012, we started to have the, the second generation with CAN ID. And um, last year, we already started with the third generation. Why is this necessary to have these three generations? This is because the automotive industry has different requirements. You may remember that uh, the early days, maybe 1995, when BMW introduced CAN into their cars, they have had just five nodes. This is all what there was CAN connected. Um, of course, in the meantime, we have more, but this was uh, integrated uh, step by step, and uh, it looks like a patchwork family. You see that you have started with some, and in the last 20 years, there came more more nodes into the network, even different kind of uh, communication technologies, not just CAN. There was MOST, there was LIN, and in the meantime, there's also Ethernet. But this, so to say, chaotic network is not more manageable. So the idea was uh, to have some new in-vehicle network architecture, which was domain-oriented. Software guys thought, okay, it would be very nice to have a, a, a clearly structured by means of use cases. For example, you have for the advanced driver, assistance systems, one for body comfort, one for connectivity, one for drive train, and one for in infotainment, and so on. This requires, of course, uh, the increasing number of nodes, more payload was needed, and also some more um, uh, uh, throughput through the uh, K networks. Of course, uh, this could be backboned by by, a can, uh, by an Ethernet network, and then you have in the in the different domains you have then the sublayered uh, network technologies, FlexRay, Kain, Lin, whatever you like to use. With this approach, software oriented, you have one uh, let's say trade off. You lengthen the cable, and cables are heavy. And if you have more cable link necessary, this also may increase uh, the difficulties uh, in maintenance. Then the third generation, and this relates to the Ken um, uh, generations, we have now the Sonal in-vehicle architecture. You have just four powerful or one powerful uh, distributed control system. And of course, you have locally, this means geographically locally, some additional uh, subzone uh, networks, and this also can be, of course, CAN, LIN, or whatever you have. So this is what the development of the in-vehicle network architectures, and CAN follow this by means of the classical CAN, uh, then for the domain with CAN ID, and now we are looking for the third generation of in-vehicle networking, which is called Sonal in-vehicle ar network architectures. Of course, this is all theory because none of those uh, architectures will be uh, as, uh, as clean implemented as they are proposed. There will be always migration passes from the history to the future, and any of the OAM will have its own ideas how to migrate from the, from the past to the future. So what uh, if CANXL is related more or less to the subzone in vegan network, uh, there are some requirements. The OEMs require worldwide nearly the same. Network scalability regarding bitrate and data length. They don't want to spend something which is very expensive or very uh, powerful for a simple use case. Also, as I mentioned already, the integration of legacy in vehicle network approach should be possible because you don't will change any uh, application in your car, not in one shot. Of course, those um, in-vehicle networks should follow an open communication standards. They want to have multi-source components and protocol stacks. We need standardized conformance tests. We need independent interoperability tests. And no doubt, anything should be available for reasonable prices. 
Robustness is still required of the signals on the physical layer. Reliable data link layer protocols are, are needed. And multiple higher layer protocols sharing the same cable. This is one of the ideas when you have uh, this more geographical approach. And of course, we have to tunnel even in the uh, low end uh, networks on the subzone networks, we have to tunnel and forward Ethernet frames. And there may be more requirements. So what is CanXL when we started to develop this? Uh, what was our ideas, which features we have to provide? Backwards compatibility to KNFD. We learned our lessons from KNFD uh, with a backwards compat not 100% backwards compatibility to classical CAN. Uh, this was mentioned in one of the previous presentations. We want to separate the uh, use case for the um, for the indicating the priority and the addressing. As you know, uh, classical CAN and KNFD use one identifier for both purposes to, uh, to, to assign the priority to a, mass, uh, to, to a frame and the content, meaning the address. Uh, so this is now clearly separated. We need, because of backwards of, of compatibility to, to Ethernet, we need a lot larger payload. And we have decided to have a payload of 2048 bytes plus a 32-bit address field. We also uh, have such long uh, frames uh, in, in mind, and then we need a cascaded CRC to achieve a true hemming distance of six. Well, we uh, think, and this is not 100% fixed, but I think it's uh, more or less fixed for the, uh, for the not fixed stuff bits, for the dynamic stuff bits, that we will have after 11 bits of the, of the, of the same polarity, we will have uh, another um, a bit of another polarity. The stuff bit counter is, should be integrated in the frame CRC field as in KNFD, we learned our lessons. And uh, the data link layer will provide the start of frame and the end of frame as in classical CAN and KNFD. Additionally, we have also uh, thought about uh, that we're running different protocols on the same um, uh, cable. So we need some kind uh, of protocol type this is similar to that what Ethertype is specifying in Ethernet. Additionally, we also want to run different applications on the same uh, cable. Uh, therefore, we need a virtual CAN ID. Um, and uh, so that is uh, also to manage uh, the, uh, this OC layer. And what we also have, uh, we still use the CAN R frames and we don't allow uh, remote frames as in uh, KNFD. And in classic CAN, it's also not recommended to use remote frames, even if they are specified. Let's have a look to the different parts and why we have done things. In classical CAN and KNFD, the CAN ID field 11 bit or 29 bit is used for bus arbitration and for addressing purposes. This could be node addresses, it could be also uh, the addressing the content. In CANXL, these functions are separated. We have an 11-bit priority field, and this field provides the uniquely assigned priority of the CANXL data frame by the system designer. Additionally, we have a 32-bit address field. This field is included in the 64-bit hardware filter of the CANXL controller, and it may contain node address or content indication information. This means we could use it uh, for legacy CAN higher layer protocols, just by mapping the 29-bit ID or, or some parts of the 29-bit ID into the 32-bit address field. And independent of that, we can uh, still assign a unique priority by means of the 11-bit, which is 2048 different priorities. This is more than, uh, for example, Generator 9 has specified they have just three bits for the priority. And the remaining bits are, uh, of the 29-bit identifiers are used for addressing purposes. But now we have much more uh, capability uh, to design higher layer protocols. The virtual CAN ID uh, or field is, is a good idea. It's an 8-bit field. And so we can have virtually running 256 different 
networks on one KNXL network segment. So we have higher bandwidth available. We can even map multiple of them into or running them in parallel on the same cable. This enables the implementation of multiple heterogeneous network, networks determined by the protocol on payload type. This field is an, is an embedded uh, OC layer management information as described in ISO 7498-4 from 1998. A long, long time ago, uh, the, idea, uh, the, the, the people from the IT business have had all, already those ideas, and now we may reference these frameworks and uh, can make uh, use of the general ideas. The protocol and payload type, uh, this is another 8-bit field. And this indicates the used next OC layer protocol. It contains, so to say, an embedded management information. Uh, and the following types are in the moment intended. We have no protocol or not known. We have legacy CAN-based higher layer protocols, so like an open J9039, ISOPAS, whatever you have. We can tunnel Ethernet frames. We can transport TCP IP segments. We can use can open or can open FD. And we can use the J9039-21 um, messages for that purpose. And of course, we will also provide a range uh, for uh, proprietary for manufacturer specific solutions. And maybe if there are more people than uh, want to sub or want to request a, a payload type, we will be open to manage that. The basic idea of a protocol app is very similar to the ether type field in the Ethernet frame. Cascaded CRCs have some advantages because uh, the one CRC uh, protects also the other CRC. And uh, both CRCs, which we have uh, specified for uh, the CANXL uh, data frame uh, are able to detect any five randomly distributed bit errors, and this corresponds to a hamming distance of six. Of course, we uh, will double check this, and the universities of Stuttgart and Kassel, they are evaluating the reliability of the CANXL data frame. The University of Stuttgart has done it already, and the, uh, the second double check by the University of Kassel is uh, uh, just starting and um, so then we can guarantee that uh, all uh, possible failures will be detected and uh, that the, uh, the design of these CRCs are correctly done. The payload um, of the uh, KNXL data frame is made of different uh, fields. We have the four byte address field containing the full or a part of the network layer header and footer. We have additionally the 2048 byte data field, which is larger than the largest uh, CAN uh, Ethernet frame, which has 2000 bytes. And um, it may contain also optionally other information. Additionally, the 11 bit priority field and the 11 bit DLC belong formally to the DLL payload. So they need to be provided by the network layer or any other higher layer protocol on top of uh, KNXL. We have just a few weeks ago started uh, to introduce an optional data link layer security. And the related uh, task force has started uh, to develop uh, um, such a data link layer security protocol. And uh, there, of course, there's one bit indicating if this frame is using uh, this protocol or not. And then each uh, and, the, and the security protocol for the data link layer features a four byte header with cipher control information, the, con the can secure channel ID and the, ref and the freshness value. Additionally, there's a 16-byte tra trailer containing the 128-bit authentication tag. So this is not an end-to-end -end security. It's just from data link layer to data link layer node. But it makes for an attacker much more complicated um, 
to, uh, to hack this because if this is independent, automatically done in hardware, uh, this uh, will be not so easy to be hacked. The physical layer on CanXL, if we want to provide higher bit rates, uh, we need uh, to specify something. And um, of course, uh, during the classical CAN arbitration, uh, in the arbitration phase, uh, we are limited to those, uh, to those bit rates as in classical CAN and CAN FD. So this is one megabit per second. And uh, the selected uh, bit rate determines also the network length. The higher the bit rate, the shorter the possible network length and vice versa. Everybody knows that. In the data phase, uh, the maximum bit rate is not limited by the network length. It can be 10 megabit and more, depending on the transceiver capabilities and the other physical layer components, oscillators, cables, connectors. Today, we have discussed this, and I think we are going uh, in the direction to 60 megabit per second as a maximum, depending on the oscillator. Uh, but normally, I think we'll, we need some safety margin uh, for that. Uh, 10 megabit will be possible, and even maybe 12 megabit uh, seems to be realistic. We use uh, dual mode transceivers, so this is new in CAN technology. But before we talk about the dual mode transceivers, have in mind that you can use any transceiver with the CAN-XL um, protocol controller, of course. Then you are limited in the speed, but you can use then also the 2048 byte payload and whatever. So the scalability is available. And for higher bit rates, this dual mode uh, transceiver is used and will be specified in the CIA 610 series. And the dual mode transceivers run in two modes, in the slow and the fast mode. In both modes, buses biasing is active. In the slow mode, there are dominant and recessive bits, as you know it from classical CAN and CAN FD. In the fast mode, there are level one and level zero signals. And they have different voltage levels. And what we need now, if we have uh, this more complex uh, um, handling of, of signals, you need a more intelligent interface, which is called the medium independent CAN interface, abbreviated MICI, which is still under development. This medium independent CAN interface uh, between dual mode transceivers and the CAN XL protocol co controllers uh, is in, we have in the moment two general approaches on the table with some advantages and disadvantages, uh, not to say they are trade-offs. Um, and some of the variants uh, and optional features need also to be considered, which was brought in by different parties. And CIA members will decide on one of the solutions very soon. I think I uh, hope that we will uh, have uh, within um, June a solution and so that we can uh, go forward in the specification for that purpose. In classical CAN and CAN-FD, we have never thought that in depth about higher layer protocols, but we're doing this from the beginning. And we have also a task force for that purpose. And um, we will specify some protocol types and uh, the corresponding usage of the address field. In the moment, we have only a mind to have uh, the, 60, uh, the, the four byte address field, and this should be sufficient uh, to describe the next layer. CIA will also support an improved uh, ISO 15765 transport protocol using the 2048 byte data field. CIA will also support uh, the, a multi PDU concept for homogeneous and heterogeneous application layers. This will be then also part of the uh, payload type and uh, for that, but this will be maybe a second step and not in the beginning. And we will also specify for each supported uh, layer management protocols in order to give the network designers as much freedom in selecting protocols as possible. So the general idea is you can select for each layer 
any protocol and this should be supported. So this would also then allow the, uh, to provide multi-protocol stacks and you can really share then uh, historical uh, current and future protocols all on the same cable. CIA is highly committed uh, to test interoperability of transceivers and protocol controllers in, uh, net, in real network environments. Therefore, we will organize so-called PlugFest when prototype implementations of dual mode transceivers and CanXL controllers are available. Of course, the CanXL controllers can be also tested with uh, SIG transceivers or uh, even with classical CAN transceivers from the protocol point of view. The automotive industry is also requesting conformance testing, even if conformance testing does not guarantee interoperability, but it increases the probability of, of interoperability. Therefore, CIA will specify for all CAN XL related specification conformance test plans. Those test plans can be implemented by test houses to perform manufacture independent conformance tests, as in the past. Yeah, this was uh, in short some summary on that what is ongoing in the CAN XL business and how we develop this. Uh, of course, everybody's invited to participate in the working groups as a member. Most of the chip makers are, are members and some OEMs are as well. Thank you, Holger, for your presentation. I think we are now at the end of, uh, of this event. Thank you very much for attending. And um, once again, uh, we would appreciate to meet you again in Canon Automation Working Groups. Um, so as I've emphasized during the event, we can only consider those requirements and wishes in our documents um, where we got your contributions. So for the moment, thank you very much for attending. Bye.